And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Are Bengal tigers related to Burmese tigers and all other tiger species? Are all known species of tiger related to each other and all other panthers? Are all panthers related to felines, scimitar cats, and other felids? Let us begin with the cat clade. We know the eight main lineages go back to the Sudelurus, which it descended from the Proelirus. Proelirus is considered largely to be the first true cat and the ancestor of the entire cat family. Most studies support this, placing Polaris at the basal member of the feline classification. The bones of Proalirus are very similar to the living Viverids and Fossa of Madagascar today. Cat connoisseurs have long known that their feline friends have a wild origin. Now scientists have identified that the house cat's maternal ancestors are traced back to one place, the Fertile Crescent. Genetics proves that there are eight main lineages of the feline cat order. Seven of the eight major cat lineages are linked by hybridization. Only one, the bay cat lineage, has not been linked to hybridization, but this is speculation to this day. These eight lineages, which are now 37 different species, all descended from eight types of base cats. The puma ancestor gave rise to the cheetah and the jaguar of today. The lynx gave rise to the Iberian and Canadian bobcats of today, and so on down the line. Today, we have 44 cat breeds alone, just in the common house cat. As you can see, it is very easy to track something back to a single species. Well, what happened when you track back to the eight main lineages? Well, when you find the branch narrows, you get to a few base cats like the Pseudolirus and the Proalirus. Even a 2005 phylogeny study placed the Proalirus as a basal member of the feline family. So, not only do we have genetic data to support that this cat gave rise to all the cat kinds we see today, we can also see that the genetic data shows extinct felids found in the fossil record were cats as well. They just died out. We creationists could easily say that God had created two or three separate types of cat in the beginning during creation week. Why not? It just seems redundant to me, but I cannot know for sure. But it's just as plausible that only one type of feline needed to exist during creation, as long as it contained all of the genetic diversity and heterozygosity needed to produce what we see in the world today. The evidence seems to be clear that God did create a single type of cat. Besides orphan genes and feline-specific ERVs and viruses, we even have more evidence outside of genetics now that shows the extent of the melanistic coat colors and patterns arose from a single original type that was either small spots or flecks. This is highlighted by changes observed in pelage patterns of jaguars and leopards during their development. Evidence is further backed up by a study by Liu and colleagues using their mathematical models. Since it's clear today that eight species of feline created all 37 species of feline and 44 cat breeds of today, then it's pretty obvious and feasible that God could have created a single feline to speciate into all the different kinds that we see today. Just like we now know for a fact that all humans descended from a single common female ancestor and we have all the different varieties and distinct people across the entire earth today. The original feline, nor any original species, didn't have to make it onto the Ark either. This is just an example of how many varieties can come from a single point. Unlike breeds of domestic horses, dogs, sheep, and cattle, some of which are thousands of years old, most cat breeds were developed within the past 150 years, mainly in Europe and the United States. Now, in the textbooks, phylogeny of carnivores links cats, skunks, raccoon, bear, and wolves, all as having a common ancestor, totally the opposite of creation's predictions. Why do they do this? Why do they assume this in the first place? It is solely because of taxonomy. Anything to them that falls into the carnivore can be linked. Thus, they now have to find other correlations to build their phylogenetic trees. So next, they use homology, which is just ridiculous to me because a raccoon, wolf, and cat 
they have more differences than they have similarities. But like all things, anybody can see what they want if they look hard enough. Lastly, they use genetics. But what is genetic comparison between a cat and a raccoon, or a skunk, or a hyena, or a wolf? Well, that's a good question. Since cats and dogs are supposedly to be genetic cousins of the same tree, they should have a lot of similarities in biology, right? Well, even dogs were closer to humans at 95% than cats were to dogs. Then they found cats were closer to humans than dogs were to cats as well. Their common ancestry fell apart with observable, testable genetic data. This just proves how lousy it is to rely on homology or taxonomy to answer any of the tough questions. In conclusion, at least they did say that the cat was very biologically unique. But look, they had to make excuses for finding such genetic discrepancy. Such as, there must have been just too much domestication of the modern day dog's genome and not much of the cats to get this genetic similar match they were looking for. This is their rescuing device for the disaster which showed only a modest comparison between the two species of dog and cat, which were supposed to have more in common than all of the other species which ended up having more, even though those other species, being the cow and human, were well outside of the cat's own taxa claden species. Can a cat mate with a raccoon since they are supposedly a very close relative to one another? No. Frankly, I have no idea why they try to put these two together, because even taxonomically they are not the same. Cats are pure obligate carnivores, when raccoons are pure omnivores and always have been. It's the same with the skunk. Omnivores, not carnivores. Their entire physiology and internal anatomy are entirely different. So obviously, tossing these animals in via taxonomically, saying that they are all pure carnivora, is bias. They smuggle these animal species into carnivora taxa by using wordplay, altering the true meaning of carnivore, which should be meat-eating organisms which derive their energy and nutrient requirements from a diet consisting mainly of animal tissue. That's right, taxonomy says carnivory is just incorporating vertebrae flesh into the diet. This way, they can add something into carnivora if they need to without them ever being true carnivores or obligate carnivores. Basically, the only reason all these species made it into the carnivora group is because of their blade-like carnassial teeth match. Which is odd to me, because now we know many bears and dog species today do not eat flesh of any kind. So they assume relation mostly based on homologous teeth structure, even though everything else is vastly different. And in the case like bears, even that doesn't line up. That's right, true carnassial teeth do not develop in any bear, from intestinal length, salivatory pH, colon, body shape, etc., very little match down the line with any of these animals. No one would observationally look at a dog, cat, bear, or skunk and presume that they were related at all. Also consider, cats are observational and dogs are olfactory based, so they don't even match in that area. Assumption and hypothesis is all they really have to link common ancestry together. The matter of fact, since they also claim bears are in the same family, remember? Well, multiple bears now has pulled the rug right out from under them, all found to be fully-fledged plant-eating vegetarians. As you can see, them trying to build their phylogenetic tree connecting all these animals together is totally worthless. Stick to genetics and follow it back. Stop assuming relation based primarily on homology. All they're doing is just digging themselves a bigger hole to get it out of with all their biased assumptions that they need to be true. Cats are genetically breaking down as well, like all things. That's right, mutations abound in the cat kind as well, with over 250 deleterious mutations that have been documented in domestic cats, including taillessness in Mannix cats, congenital defects of white cats, twisted tail syndrome in the American ringtail cats, split foot syndrome in Japanese bobtail, the white tiger lack the capacity to produce red and yellow pigments. This is all caused by a single point mutation in their gene. This is all just more evidence and proof of genomic decay, which is our model of creation, and not evolution and adaptation, like evolutionists want to tell us. Things are not getting stronger, better, and more resistant. They are degrading and getting worse, and all of the evidence proves it. No storytelling required. 
We creationists also have allele evidence as well to help us determine a created kind. We say the more rare the allele is, the more mutated. The more common the allele, the more likely it was a created kind. All evidence from existing cat hybrids and lineages, the fossil record evidence and various other features including molecular sequencing data, genetics, pelage, patterns, and unique virus sensitivities, all point to the feline cat family representing a single clearly delineated basic type. It is reasonable then, with all the evidence available, to say that all these felines arose from a single basal founded cat, and since then, they have passed through one or more adaptive radiations and speciations, exploiting their inherent morphogenetic potential to produce all the known existing and extinct species of cat. Thus, it is reasonable and logical for us as creationists to assume that there was a single cat that was created kind, because all of the evidence clearly shows this to be true. Now, could something prior to the pro Proalyris given rise to it? Sure, why not? But the fact remains. No genetic data, or any data for that matter, solidifies that opinion. The Proalyris is the first cat, the first of its created kind, and it populated the entire world we see today. That is what the evidence shows, and that is what we say. What about Nymphorids, which are a genius of extinct scimitar or saber-toothed cats only found in North America, are considered not part of the cat order? I am confident that they are wrong on this assumption that Nymphorids do not belong to the cat order. The difference between Nivirids and the feline order display only minute skeletal differences, indistinguishable in almost every area. This is why there was such a dispute. But calling an extinct cat a non-cat that is otherwise clearly a cat, simply for classification purposes and based solely on ossification bones in their ear, seems excessive and outright dishonest. Why do they do this? Well, because it doesn't match up with their phylogenetic tree that they made. So see how biased they are? If they need something to work, they will just make it up and place it where it wants regardless. Yet when it doesn't match up, they ignore it entirely. Nymphorids were like lions and tigers today. DNA has proven that yes, they were cats. What happened is that they speciated from the basal ancestor branch and died off because of extinction. Most people do not realize how easy it is for carnivores to die off. And since we're dealing with the cat species that transition to pure obligate carnivores, and carnivores are very susceptible to extinction, then we can see why there are so many extinct cats back in the fossil record. And we do see this even in many cat species alive today, which have died out via extinction because they are carnivorous and ran out of food sources and pervasive selection from hyperdietary specialization. It is proven that hypercarnivory leads to increased vulnerability and extinction, even where in cracking on their carnassial teeth may result in the death of the individual due to starvation. Carnassial teeth infection are common in domestic dogs and present as abscesses. As for the ecological niche of large carnivores, these animals typically make up only a small part of the ecological diversity of any given area. This fact directly relating to 1. the availability of food and success rate involved in catching something, and 2. territorially. If predators equaled or outnumbered their prey, while also having to contend with disease, injury, and other factors of mortality, the ecosystem would not be sustainable. Carnivores would eat themselves out of house and home, literally. Likewise, given the fact that carnivores do not migrate with herds, rather hold down territories, there is only so much room in a given area for carnivores of a particular species to exist. Given this observation, it is often strange when we come across mass assemblages of carnivores in the fossil record. To me, this is more proof that Noah's Flood helped these things form, such as massive dinosaur graveyards. Besides, observation and logic tells us that this is not how animals behave in the world we see today. So why assume that such a large number of predators congregated back then? Think about it. If the group doesn't seem to be a family or a social group, why were they together? The Bible has no documentation on what any of the created kinds were. So we have to infer, using as much genetics as possible, and even the fossil record unfortunately. And this is really tough because almost all life was wiped out because of Noah's Flood. The Bible is vague on the topic of created kinds because it is not a salvational topic, nor one that needed much attention. The word kind is actually used to describe many different things. Kind, a large group, are called animal kind. Then it is used again with bird kind. Then it becomes more specific with the hawk kind. So it's far too vague to give a specific definition. 
people should understand that it is an umbrella term, like mankind. Would you not classify a midget, or an albino, or a mongoloid part of mankind? Of course you would. The Hebrew word is where the attention should be, not the English word kind. Original word in the Strong's Concordance is that of min, like in minute. It is from an unused root word to portion out or to sort kind, species, a part of a whole, an amount, a section, or a piece of something. So this would mean that kind is a mixture between subspecies and order and falls somewhere between that category. I think the tree of life is an artifact of uh, some early scientific studies that aren't really holding up. So the, the tree, uh, you know, there, there may be a bush of life. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, bush. A tree. I don't like that word. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, Richard, oh, but that's only in. Terms right, I can of, see uh, that one. Yeah. yeah. So there is not a tree of life, and in fact, from our deep sequencing of organisms in the ocean, out of now we have about 60 million uh, different. Uh, uh, unique gene sets, uh, we found 12 that look like a very, very deep branching, perhaps fourth domain of life. I think I'm done with you. Good, shut up. There's nothing to cry about, okay? The Caproni subfamily is a convoluted mess to sort out, consisting of two species of Sudaios, six Soro, four Garal, one Mountain Goat, seven Ovis, eight Ibex, two Caucasian Tur, one Barberry Sheep, three Tahar, and one Markor. Ancient biblical wording from Hebrew indicate that sheep and goat belong to a basic type or group belonging to the same kind in monobaromology. I was still able to determine the original created kind even through this convoluted mess. I have determined it is the wild Benzora ibex, or the Persian ibex. This was the original goat of today. Let's begin with recent studies based on mitochondrial DNA, which prove the West Caucasian Tur appeared to be more closely related to this wild goat than even its own Eastern Caucasian Tur sister. This new genetic evidence conclusively proves that the Persian Ibex wild goat is related to the genus, which until recently was not even considered related. The Markor as well is related. It is only relatively separated by a little bit from other goat forms. Previously, it had been considered a separate branch of the genus altogether. The Perineum chamois, which descended from the wild goat, gave rise to the chamois, which speciated into the growls and sorrows of today. New mitochondrial chromosome B testing and nucleotide substitution rate testing prove this. So much for the growls and sorrows coming first, like they assumed and told us for decades based only on fossils. And since we have validated genetically that the alpine ibex descended from the Persian ibex, then it is clear and obvious that we have narrowed down the basal ancestor for all living sheep and goats to the Persian ibex. Specifically regarding sheep, the wild goat, known as the Persian ibex, gave rise to the wild mouflon, which speciated into all the modern day sheep we see today. Based on comparison of mitochondrial cytochrome B gene sequences, all six subspecies of sheep have been identified now to the Siberian snow sheep, bighorn or doll sheep of North America, agrali of Central Asia, and the domestic sheep of Eurasia. Ureal is found in the western Central Asia and northern eastern Iran and western Kazakhstan to Pakistan all the way to India and traced back to the mouflon. So we can be sure now as well that the wild mouflon gave rise to the modern day sheep because genetics has proven this which again should be the primary indicator of relation before one resorts to presumption via the fossil record. All modern domestic day sheep breeds descended from the ancestor of the Parisian ibex, the mouflon, and all domestic sheep today are from the mouflon and are numbering over 1 billion worldwide. You see, it is taught by evolution that multiple waves of independent migrations of wild goat had to have taken place in Europe. This is because of their assumption of old scale timelines must be true and this is why they rely so heavily on paleoontological studies alone. They also have no consideration of Noah's flood distribution, which describes it to be just a single wave migration. They tell us the first migration wave occurred probably 300,000 years ago and led to the origin of the alpine ibex from the Parisian ibex. 
The second migration probably took place around 80,000 years ago, leading to the origin of the Spanish ibex. So with their scenario, no close relationship would be expected between these European species, right? However, current mtDNA data indicated that a much smaller genetic distance between these two Eurasian species than even between other existing Capra species. Thus, another scenario had to be proposed. After looking at the evidence, they had no other way of getting around the only possible conclusion, whereby the only one way of migration was possible. It came from Europe, following by a speciation process that originated the two current species. A paleoontological find in Germany gave a detailed description of a capra specimen which included the characteristics of both modern taxa alive today, supporting the single wave hypothesis and aligning with Noah's flood animal dispersion predictions. Goats are among the earliest animals domesticated by humans, and most recent genetic analysis confirms the archaeological evidence that both the wild Persian ibex of the Zagros Mountains is the original ancestor of all domestic goats today. With even more studies, we have tracked sheep of the wild mouflon, and these mouflon have been traced to the Persian ibex, based on the new genetic evidence. The proof comes from the domestication of a B subgroup in China, supported by genetic data, which comes from the wild ancestor of the domestic goat, i.e. the Benzora Persian ibex. This is just more conclusive evidence that we can easily track lineage back to a single root ancestor. Since people still do not consider these two related, because one is a sheep and the other is a goat, then I really must give substantial evidence to prove their relation. First, consider sheep are like dogs are to wolves. All dogs descended from wolves, just like all sheep descended from goats. Now, for more proof the mouflon and the ibex are related, the genomes of the wild mouflon and the Bizoran Persian ibex in the sheep and goat domestication center compared their genomes with that of domestics from local, traditional, and improved breeds. The goat was domesticated from the Bizoran ibex in the Fertile Crescent. This was discovered in 1996. This origin was confirmed by genetic studies based on mitochondrial and nuclear DNA. Also, more proof comes from the documentation allowing scientists to test specific skeletal remains. For those that think sheep and goat are not related, consider this. They can also breed with one another. Their offspring are called geep. Evolutionary scientists ignore genetic data over their fossil record. This is stupidity to say the least. Genetic data in 2005 from mitochondrial diversity data and phylogeographic structure of Chinese domestic goats proved that the Persian ibex was the basal parent ancestor of all modern-day sheep and goats. Also, of the 20 genomic region candidates common in sheep and goat, 14 selection signatures were congruent in both species. Even four genes showed pleiotrophic effects and have been related to phenotypic effects between the two. However, since they directly state that they use chromosome B because it evolves less rapidly, and they mix it with the fossil record to adjust and calibrate a timeline. This is all circular assumption based around an old timeline and evolution being true in the first place. It's why they will always fail at obtaining accurate results because they will never consider an alternative. While trying to figure out where the domestication center of sheep was, they began studying the haplotypes. In doing so, they confirmed that the mouflon sheep was the head of all the sheep family, which itself descended from the Benzora Persian ibex of the Fertile Crescent. They tell us today that the Eotragus is the parent basal common ancestor of all creprids. This is all they have or evidence for that, by the way. Like I said, it's all storytelling. No DNA evidence, nothing. They go by a small handful of fossils. That is it. Evolution tells us that modern-day goats, sheep, deer, ibex, antelope, adducts, gazelle, water buffalo, cows, and zebu have diverged from the rest of the Bovidae in the early Miocene era, diverging from the Sybarids and the Giraffids from Eotragus. As you can see, they link the tree branches where there was no physical connection. This is how they build their tree of lies. Next, they tell us that the ancestors of the entire genus Capra, aka goat, were Goral-like animals, which arose first probably during the Miocene or early Pliocene era. Evidence for this is still lacking. It is just assumed from a single set of fossils which they believe are Goral's in appearance. 
But when genetics tells you one thing and fossils assume something else, you have to go where the biology evidence goes. You may be asking, so what other evidence do they have that these caprid cattle-like ancestors evolved into goats and sheep? Well, taxonomy. That's all. Just classification. Not biology, not genetics, or anything of value. I can understand that cladistics is a tool used to make a hierarchy tree of life and is the last line of defense used for lack of actual evidence and the only rescuing device used in their arguments when they have lost, but just repeating hierarchical classification names doesn't actually provide evidence or proof in any way, shape, or form, or that that one organism is the actual ancestor of another. It doesn't demonstrate evolution. It demonstrates whatever story you want it to be, or what anyone else wants it to be. There is no reason to assume that nodes of a cladiogram represent punitive ancestors, and without actual evidence besides observational homology of fossils, they have no true evidence, only assumption. And that is what fossils are, pure assumption. It is storytelling at best. It's just like saying those species had something physiologically in common with another, not that one gave rise to another. That is all pure conjecture, based on nothing. The evolutionist thinks it's obvious that if a very small group migrates away from a larger group, that the new group will obviously have less genetic diversity than the larger group that came before it. Yet, the evidence shows otherwise on every study that's been done. Let's look at a couple for just a minute. Let's look at the actual, observable, testable genetic diversity, shall we? Here are some reasons to believe that the simple models are actually not accurate at all. In 1957, a single pair of mouflon sheep were left on one of the Kruligan Islands near the Atlantic Circle. In the beginning of the 1970s, the number had grown to 100 individuals and peaked at 700 sheep in 1977. Given that the population began with only two individuals, the flounder effect, the researchers expected low genetic diversity, measured by heterozygosity. In 2007, the genetic diversity of the ancestors of those sheep was tested and found to be at least four times greater than the simple mathematical models predicted. In other words, the models underestimated the genetic diversity of the actual population because they had based all of their models of a preconceived notion that evolution was true. Take away the assumption and you were left with the facts. Other tests of these simplified mathematical models have failed as well. A small population of white-tailed deer introduced into the Finland were tested for their genetic diversity in 2012 and again found to have much more diversity than expected based on their simple models. Three more studies indicating that when direct genetic diversity was measured for animal populations on the verge of extinction, it was much greater than expected, based on predictions derived from the mathematical models. The study involving sheep, bacteria, horses, and gray whales, in which the initial populations were all known, researchers measured the genetic diversity many generations after the initial populations were established. The genetic diversity was known down the line, was much greater than ever expected, again, based on models relating genetic diversity and population size. In other words, their assumption method failed validation in each of these cases where all known origin of two individuals were conclusively known. If these same models were used to estimate the effective sizes of the ancestral population from the measured genetic diversity at any point in time, they would have overestimated the original population sizes as much larger than two individuals. All models underestimated the genetic diversity of the actual population. So if observable data presents one thing and then scientists tell you another, why believe it? Oh, that's right, never mind, don't question anything. Their dating methods of diversity are all wrong because it's based on pure assumption. It presumes long-scale evolution to be true, so they just add it to all calculations. It's untrustworthy and I prove it because I use their own words. In 406 unrelated animals from 48 breeds of local varieties, the sequence segment spans 721 in relation to the full sheep mitochondrial sequence, even though Sanderson in 2003 used to estimate the time of the most recent common ancestor for each distinct domestic sheep lineage. They still came to the conclusion that mutation rates seem much faster and higher in the recent rather than the ancient phylogenetic history. Ho and Larson, 2006. Yeah, no kidding. So they made up a presumed guest using an evolutionary assumption and it was not accurate. What a shock. But don't worry, the evidence was presented as old anyway. 
If you take into consideration this and the fact that all evolutionary predictions in the past put against real-world results prove them to be a failure, it is safe to presume that they are completely off on their assumptions of this evolutionary history as well. We all know that they use biased trio dating methods, which assume long-scale time evolution to be true. Now, how about even more direct observational testing methods? You are about to see how biased and indoctrinated they truly are. Look at this. All the represented molecular dates should be interpreted cautiously. They should not be strongly affected by the recent observational nonlinearity and apparent mutation rates, which suggest that mutation rates seem much higher in the recent rather than their ancient phylogenetic history. So, they got results that didn't line up because they were far too fast. Because they instead just assume an old-scale timeline must be true, they went around the actual observable testable evidence and made up their own. This is just the kind of science you get with SpongeBob universities worldwide. Next, orphan genes. The working assumption had been that, given common descent, and the fact that most housekeeping genes are shared among living things is highly conserved, including the prior assumption that evolution occurs by extremely small changes. Orphan genes should be rare, if not non-existent. However, as scientists sequenced more genes from different organisms, they are discovering that roughly 10-40% to 40 of each genome's protein coding sequence is new, that is, unlike any other known protein coding sequence. These are orphan genes. And this was one of the biggest surprises to come out of the whole genome sequencing project. Before I can get into it, remember this quote by noble Laurel Francis Jacob. He explained the accepted view of how evolution constructed new genes. He said, Once life has started in the form of some primitive self-replicating organism, further evolution had to produce through alterations of already existing compounds. As you can see, new genes must arise from pre-existing genes, leaving the signal of ancestry in their closely related sequences, because the probability of an alternative is basically nothing. Zero. That is why the discovery of orphan genes, which now show no homology to other sequences, came as a great surprise. It was assumed that getting new genes was hard, and once a workable solution was found, it would be preserved in the descendants that followed. The bulk of genes would have been invented early in evolution, and thus would be broadly shared. However, orphan genes are without detectable homologies in other lineages. Orphans are a subset of taxonomically restricted genes, which are unique to a specific taxonomic level. To put it another way, orphan genes differ from all other genes in that they are lineage-specific, with no known history of shared duplication and rearrangement outside of their specific species or clade. This is yet another way we are able to identify what a created kind is. A human would share orphan genes with primates if common ancestry were true. The fact we share 0% is utter proof that humans were a separate created kind and creationism is true, not common descent. The more genomes that are sequenced, the more the proportion of orphan genes should shrink if common ancestry were true, as more and more orphans should be shown to be present in other genomes. But that is not proven to be the case. The mountain of orphan genes is growing with every new clade tested, not shrinking. Similarly, horizontal gene transfer was not borne out. The sister genes of orphans should have been found as sample size increased, reducing the proportion of orphan genes. As for gene loss as an explanation, well, it would have been too massive to be realistic to account for the pattern seen. The fact we find orphan genes can only decay but never give rise is also more evidence for our side as well. No testable, observable studies have ever proven that new orphan genes can arise in a species which already had or lost them. The only place this has happened is in the imagination of textbooks. It is also a fact that they are genes without detectable homologies in other lineages. So a fly orphan gene and a human orphan gene are very unique and identifiable. If common descent were true, we should see traces left behind of the orphan protein three-dimensional structure in other species, especially those closest on a taxonomic level, and that is not what we see. Orphan genes are a wonderful for creationists and a nightmare for evolution. David Usuri, a biologist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, and his collaborators compared 1,000 genomes. They found trying to build relations for phylogenetic trees is a waste of time because genetically there is not enough shared information between all life. They state, and I quote, There are different ways to have a core set of instructions, but of the 1,000 genomes available, not a single protein is conserved across all genomes. 
The 2018 Gene Research Study looked through 5 million genetic imprints on 100,000 animal species throughout the world to find one of the most surprising discoveries about evolution to date, that they have all been wrong. Evolution predicted that everything evolved up from a single cell, yet this new research looked at a selected portion of DNA from a hundred thousand different species by hundreds of different researchers from around the world. They found a telltale sign showing that all animals emerged at about the same time. Not only that, the study also found, rather unexpectedly for evolutionists, that species have clear genetic boundaries and nothing much in between. They go on to say in the study that humans and animals arose at the same time and there are genetic boundaries. Thatcher goes on to say, if individuals are stars, then species are galaxies. They are compact clusters in the vastness of empty space. The absence of in-between species is something that also perplexed Darwin, he said. This massive genetic study, which reveals that all life on Earth, including animals, birds, insects, and humans, that all appeared at the same time, should be cause for concern for the evolutionist. Their rationalization and excuses will come soon, but even the researcher himself stated, The conclusion is very surprising, and I fought against it as hard as I could. How does one explain that fact that 90% of all animal life, genetically speaking, is roughly the same age? Their answer? You guessed it. There must have been an environmental trauma causing a bottleneck that caused all living species to reduce to just a few living number of individual males and females to repopulate. Pfft. Ridiculous. So what they're trying to tell you is that this so-called bottleneck, for it to occur, had to reduce all 100,000 different species that they tested to a single maternal lineage to replace all the others to carry the entirety of the linked genome along, thereby resetting mitochondrial variation to zero. Does that sound logical at all? Even in their own peer-reviewed paper, they state that it's not logical. They say, based on contemporary mitochondrial sequence data alone, it is impossible to distinguish an organismal bottleneck from mitochondrial and Y chromosome specific lineage shortening since both mechanisms make the same prediction of a uniform mitochondrial sequence in the past. So they know and say that they cannot know this, but they will tell you that it happened anyway and expect you just to believe it because. In conclusion, they don't have evidence for this so-called bottleneck, not even their own fossil record shows any evidence of one. And, their long time period is all extrapolated from an assumption that a common ancestor exists. They go on to say, For the planet's 7.6 billion people, 500 million house sparrows, and 100,000 sandpipers, genetic diversity is about the same. They would never submit to the actual evidence of the research which shows that it's obvious that all life arose at the same time. As Kuhn points out, the unresolved arguments tend toward rhetoric. Like all scientists, they struggle to find an example or excuse to puzzle an explanation together before they commit corporate suicide for discovering evidence contrary to the evolutionary theory. They directly state, This study is one of the clearest, most data-rich, and general facts in all of evolution, that the existent population, no matter what the current size or similarity to fossils of any age, has expanded from mitochondrial uniformity, they even directly state that they use the fossil evidence of mammalian evolution in Africa theory to infer an old age of 100 to 200,000 years based on nothing but assumption and that sequence analysis has been interpreted to suggest that the last ice age created widespread conditions for a subsequent expansion. Because no actual evidence was seen for evolution, they just had to presume it happened and conclude this by stating the vista of evolution is best seen from the passenger seat. Why? Because they have no direct access to the driver's seat to witness linear macroevolution occurring. This study was just a perfect nail in the coffin for evolution. Ontologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous and that was confirmed as Sphecomirma. For one thing, this species was never found to ever have any wings. No Sphica yerma hemuli was ever found around the anterior portions, as were wasps. Their fore and hind leg wings are hooked together with groups with tiny little hooks called hemuli, which ants do not have. 
Also consider, according to evolutionists, it was believed that this evolutionary age of 79 to 92 million years ago, there had not yet been any complex social organizations of ants into colonies. However, with careful analysis of these specimens, it reveals the presence of the metapleural gland, which is only found in ants and only those that live in colonies. These glands secrete antibiotics which prevent bacteria and fungi entering the colonies. Ants were always ants. They never transitioned into flying, nor became wasps. Not a single drop of observational or testable science proves that ants became wasps. Orphan genes. The working assumption had been that, given common descent, and the fact that most housekeeping genes are shared among living things is highly conserved, including the prior assumption that evolution occurs by extremely small changes. Orphan genes should be rare, if not non-existent. However, as scientists sequenced more genes from different organisms, they are discovering that roughly 10-40% to 40 of each genome's protein coding sequence is new, that is, unlike any other known protein coding sequence. These are orphan genes, and this was one of the biggest surprises to come out of the whole genome sequencing project. Before I can get into it, remember this quote by noble Laurel Francis Jacob. He explained the accepted view of how evolution constructed new genes. He said, Once life has started in the form of some primitive self-replicating organism, further evolution had to produce through alterations of already existing compounds. As you can see, new genes must arise from pre-existing genes, leaving the signal of ancestry in their closely related sequences. In 1924, the Doheny Scientific Expedition ventured into the Havasu Canyon region of the Grand Canyon. The expedition report, penned by Samuel Hubbard, is a short but fascinating read. Now this short expedition brought multiple enigmas to the attention of the scientific community. One discovery of fossil footprints was only briefly mentioned in the report saying that Mr. Gilmore was at a loss to explain these carboniferous footprints. That Mr. Gilmore was Charles W. Gilmore, who gave more detail in the Smithsonian Miscellaneous Collections. Mr. Gilmore showed the footprints which bore a clear resemblance of horse footprints to the local Native Americans to see what they would say about them. The local Native Indians considered them to be the tracks of a band of wild horses. Now I want you to remember, Indians were natural trackers, and they could well identify any animal by its footprints, as their hunt depended on it. I would think they know what a horse footprint looked like, especially considering the fact that they owned and rode horses daily at this point. But the problem for evolutionism was that these footprints were out of place. They were in Permian rocks. The rocks were far too old, according to evolutionary theory. After all, many people still believe in the evolution of the horse. Although the sequence has been proven wrong years ago, it still appears in textbooks today, so I'm sure many listening still believe in this lie. But regardless, if you actually look at the charts, the first supposed ancestor of the horse supposedly had arisen 50 million years ago. But now, these fossil footprints in the Grand Canyon identical to those of modern-day horses, were in rocks that had been dated by evolutionists pushing 300 million years. <laughs> Not only does this totally debunk horse evolution, but it puts modern horse way down at the bottom of the geologic time scale. Mr. Gilmore did the only thing he could have done, which was attempt to explain away the footprints as not even fossil footprints a desperate rescue device. He tried to say that they were just stains in the rock. But decades later, the famous E.D. McKee visited the footprints and called them footprints. <laughs> he said it's ridiculous to not call them footprints, but he labeled them as an unidentified vertebrate animal, or just an animal with four legs. Native Americans specifically told them these are horse tracks, and they belong to that animal. The answer was so glaringly obvious, but you see, evolutionary theory does not permit the glaringly obvious conclusion. Evolutionary theory is not science. It is anti-science, 
ruling out possibilities and discoveries before they are even made, and anything that is contradictory to it. These horse fossil footprints rule out the anti-science theology, which is evolutionism. So in closing, horses supposedly evolved around 50 to 60 million years ago, yet we find horse tracks deeper than we do dinosaur tracks in the geologic column in the Grand Canyon. But it gets better. The Doheny expedition also documented the fascinating petroglyph of what they even labeled as a dinosaur. Hubbard commented that the photograph of the dinosaur, petroglyph, had been shown to a scientist of report, who then remarked, It is not a dinosaur. It is impossible because we know that dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on the earth. Gotta love how they know it's a fact, even though the very date that they quote in this is so far off by any evolutionist standard today. Now, they tell people they know that dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. And then when that date changes, the new one will be a fact. <laughs> the Auroch was a created kind. It is the basal ancestor of all domestic and wild cattle we see. The Germanic people of Europe referred to it as Ur, meaning the wild ox. It entered the English language from Germany as Arox. The species survived in Europe until 1627. The oldest of cave drawings depict these first beasts. Before it died, it gave rise to two branches of all the cattle we see today. It led to the Zebu and the Bali cattle which ended up populizing all of Indonesia. The other is related to the Eurasian subspecies, leading to the taurine cattle. A mitochondrial DNA study suggests that all domesticated taurine cattle originated from about 80 wild female aurochs in the Near East. Other species of wild bovines after this point were also domesticated, namely after the wild water buffalo, gaur, and wild benteng. All of these can be traced back to a single source, the aurochs. Even modern-day species have ancestral alleles present. In this study, the focus is on evolutionary dynamics between bovids and bovine lentiviral proteins to find relation between species. They determine the sequence of three genes in the genre of buffalo, boss, and bison, and show that the bovine gene A3Z3 is under strong positive selection. They conducted a combination of studies consisting of molecular phylogenetics, structural biology, and experimental virology. What they found was that all of them are in the same family. This means that the aurochs are the parent basal ancestor of the entire bovine and bison family. Now let's talk about bovine diversity for a minute. There are two types of water buffalo today, the African Cape buffalo and the water buffalo. There are 74 breeds of domestic water buffalo today, but only small numbers of wild water buffalo remain. The wild water buffalo is sometimes referred to as a different species, B. arni but it can interbreed with other domestic water buffalo, so it is still a debate in the community. There are two types of bison, European and American. Four of the popular bovine species today became at least partially domesticated, all of which came from Western or Southern Asia, the cow, yak, bantang, and gaiout. Recently, they took all the cattle varieties in India and tracked them back using analysis of mitochondrial, Y-chromosomal, and microsatellite DNA. Two bovine species contributed to all of the Indonesian livestock, Zebu and Benteng, aka Bali cattle, which are the ancestral populations of those alive today, which descended from the Aurochs and Zebu mating. Remember, domestic yaks, gale, and Bali cattle are not direct descendants of the Aurochs. They are way down the ladder and a far more current species. 73 modern cattle populations carry the ancestry of the sequenced Auroch genome still to this day. The Bos de France is called the ancestor of the Aurochs for one reason only, because it was found in the Pleistocene age strata of India, which they say goes back 2.6 million years or so, or as recent as 11,700. So it's basically just more storytelling coming from Spongebob universities. I mean, see for yourself, use your own eyes. Look at the skeletal remains. They look absolutely identical to one another. The only thing that separates them is the geologic column. 
modern day bovines are a genetic mess. I mean, look at the domestic yak, or wild yak for that matter. The domestic yak has a total of 3,187 deleterious mutations per individual, and the wild yak has a total of 2,067 deleterious mutations. What a disaster. This is utter proof, and just another example in the long list of species alive today with massive genomic decay. Listen to what Julius Caesar writes in the Book of Galactic Wars about the aurochs. These are a little below the size of an elephant, and of the appearance, color, and shape of a bull. Their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast, which they have espied. And again, just like with cat or the feline, we have bovine-specific ERVs as well. As you can see, there is no evidence anything came before it. All evidence points to bovine remaining bovine from the beginning of creation until now. Aaron Rawl, you have nothing to back up your arguments besides storytelling and lies. You should admit that you're a failure and just move on. I should have known better. Upon scum to people evolution, as I've said before, is pure imagination. It's science to say that dogs produce dogs, but it's not science to say that dogs, pine trees, bacteria, and whales are related. There's a lot of imagining going on. Evolutionists imagine that mutations make something new and better. Evolutionists imagine that all these small-scale variations will eventually add up to make something we don't actually observe. Time, as I've said before, is the hero of the story for the evolutionist. Evolutionists and Spongebob should start a private school together. This is the perfect way for evolutionists and like-minded individuals to teach each other that dinosaurs and carrots are related through common ancestry. Stay tuned for a thorough tour of Spongebob University. But Welcome to Spongebob University. Evolutionists hope, they dream, they imagine. Only the most imaginative of evolutionists are accepted. Requirements for those that believe they have the wild imaginations necessary for enrollment at Spongebob University, just a few of them. You must believe that natural selection and mutations can explain all new innovations, structures, body plans, and novel information, which we actually know cannot actually be the result of natural selection acting upon random variation and random mutations. Evolutionists imagine these things, even though empirical evidence tells us that neo-Darwinism lacks incredible explanatory power in regards to the origin of phenotypic complexity, anatomical novelty, and the origin of non-gradual modes of transition, abrupt fossil appearance, for example. Students of SpongeBob University must also imagine that they share ancestry with apes. Grandpa, is that you? Even though all empirical evidence suggests otherwise. I, what? I wish I could see Aaron's eyes right now. I bet they're just bulging out. <laughs> <laughs> like that cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ponds, what the, was the that argument? The ponds come to people. Dude, even lost me on yeah, that yeah. one. I don't know. <laughs> all right, everyone. Let's kick this off. This is Aaron Raw debunking our video, debunking his phylogeny challenge. Let's get this started. In this first one, because I know it's three hours worth of mindless stupidity. Wow, he must have gone through every little bit of that video, piece by piece, to complain about it being three hours. Let's see if that's true, shall we? Devise. Because they're eye type. Have you heard, so have you heard anything to do with this, Arn? Hadn't been thought of. No. Okay. Never heard of it. Uh, it's the first three seconds of the video. EAX6 is one of those pesky instances for evolution. I, I clicked on like two or three spaces in it, and I only watched it a few seconds at a time. Oh, okay. There we have it. That's the truth. He only watched a few seconds here and there on a video that he came on to debunk. Brilliant. Have you heard, so uh, have you heard anything to do with this, Arn? Hadn't been. <laughs> Pack 6 is a master control gene, so yeah, I, don't, I don't see... I mean, he's getting the... I, I think he's getting the science correct, I guess, but I don't think his conclusions follow. I don't think I've ever heard of Standing for Truth. Raw Matt sounds familiar. Oh, Standing uh, for Truth. I feel like I might even have he's, talked to him once st upon a Standing time. for Truth. Yeah, I would hope you'd remember me. We had multiple conversations. None, 
But let me guess, maybe the most popular? Well, that's argument of authority. And if we're going to use that argument, then atheists are toast as well, because your pathetic 5% of the world's population trying to say that the burden of proof is on the 95% is just oh. stupid. The masses don't oh. need to convince the minority of anything. That was a also, slap right there. Call evolution or speech it, was a, it, it was a tradition that is now being discarded that you would separate humans from apes and uh, apes from monkeys saying, you know, that, that and, and this was this is one of the problem with a, a number of traditional scientists still haven't understood. So Aaron just said that traditional scientists, even those today, just don't understand. That's what he's trying to tell you. He knows better. But yet when we try to correct science, oh no, we can't do that. See the problem? See the double standard? So when a creationist says that man and apes are not related, we're lying. But when a scientist says that they're not related, they're just mistaken or confused. Got it. When they say things like, evolution only deals in biology, then they go on and use geology, paleontology, earth scientists, and more to strengthen their argument for evolution and to help them build their phylogenetic trees, saying to others, see how all fields of science help prove evolution? It's called consilence. But yet Hold they on. get very upset when a creationist does the same thing. They no, 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 no. <laughs> No, 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 I'm not upset that evolutionists use paleontology and geology. I'm upset that during arguments and debates, I'm not allowed to use them. Everyone always says evolution only has to do with biology. If you, They didn't even understand what I was trying to say. They didn't listen. They didn't even start at the beginning. That was the problem. When they started looking recently, they found that turtles have no shells when they spend their life in the ocean. The longer they spend their time what, in the ocean, what? the less they need what? a shell. Since I don't think R and Raw either believed me or didn't understand what I was saying, I guess I'll post it here. This is the National Geographic website, who also stated that once turtles hit the water, their shell size reduces. The leatherback turtles themselves don't even have hard shells. It's not. There are two different cl uh, cladistic uh, uh, definitions for turtle. They're still debating. No, the there are not. Not there is not two different. Stand. Uh, yeah, there are two different cladistic classifications for turtles, Aaron. I don't know why I'm teaching you this. This is your specialty, for God's sake. Which major taxonomic group, or clade, of reptiles that turtles belong to? Now, most of reptiles fall under the clade known as Eureptilia, or true reptiles. This includes stuff like lizards, snakes, dinosaurs, and birds. But there's also Parareptilia, or side reptiles. These are some of the earliest reptiles, all of which are now extinct, like the spiky-cheeked Procolophonids and the Mesosaurs, which were probably the first aquatic reptiles. Now, by and large, which clade you put turtles in depends on where you think its shell came from. Turtles' exact place among the U reptiles isn't settled either. A lot of researchers think they're more closely related to the clade that includes animals like crocodiles and birds, but others argue that they're closer to a different group that includes lizards and snakes. Hopefully it won't take another 130 years for an answer to that debate. A bacteria yeah. can never produce a non-bacteria. It never happens. We didn't evolve from bacteria. We're not bacteria. Okay, one more time. A bacteria yeah. can never produce a non-bacteria. It never happens. We didn't evolve from bacteria. We're not bacteria. You hypocrite. You teach frogs came from an amoeba. <laughs> I know of the, the earliest fossil bats are neither giant nor burrowing. Listen to this. And pugs and chihuahuas are still dogs. They have never started becoming a whale like evolution claims can happen. And evolution does not claim that ever. Where in the okay. world, Matt, would you think evolution claims anywhere that a whale Whale, yeah, Cicadia, yeah. Could, 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 could evolve oh, from, because whales from, from supposedly canine. evolved from a land mammal. The tale of whale evolution is a story about one of the most remarkable transitions in the history of mammals. The fossil record shows how these animals transform from tiny four-legged plant eaters no bigger than house cats to the seafaring giants we know today. This change was dramatic and kind of fast. Evolution does not say a anything. A individual anything turns into a individual anything right. either. Paleontologists in Kashmir, India found the fossils of a 47 million year old hoofed creature the size of a house cat that they named Indohyus. Evolution does not say a anything.
a individual anything turns into a individual anything right. either. Actually, it specifically says that. Back in a SpongeBob La La Land. That's what the phylogeny challenge is, is getting them to identify what the fuck is a created kind. Okay. And honeybee All and flower pigeons. are a created kind. How is honeybee and flower a single created kind? That doesn't even make any sense. How is because a plant and an animal the same organism. kind? What? Oh, oh no. wait, because they're a symbiotic species. The flower needs a plant and a plant needs a honeybee, for example. Oh, they they true. try to say Except that beetles that they and wind did it. But. Except that they don't. And we know that earlier plants used wind for pollinization. Then and how earlier Japan insects. Does. Well, that's a presumption because Japan has now lost It's their not bees a presumption Japan... because it's. I tried telling him twice and I couldn't. So I guess I'm going to have to say it now. Aaron. Japan has lost its bees a while ago now, and since then, they have had to now pollinate by hand. Do you know why? Because wind cannot do it. And that's what evolution has told us. Matter of fact, that's what you even said to me. But the matter of fact, they have been working on a solution for a while now, and have invented tiny little drones to replace bees. So the intensive manual labor required from the burden of can be lifted from the people that have to do it by hand. If wind or insects and beetles were sufficient, then they would not have to go to such lengths. Besides, even Einstein himself said, if bees disappeared off the face of the earth, man would only have four years left to live. But it's okay. I'm sure you know far better than him. What did he ever know about anything, right? But let me get this straight. All life today that requires flowering, pollinating plants and the fruit that they bear could not survive without pollinating plants and what they bear. Therefore, bees are absolutely required. Without bees, there is no pollination. And this is a fact. And now we know it's a fact because of the devastation that is happening in China and Japan because of the dwindling bee population. Right? Primates, for example. Yet we are told bees just arose millions of years ago, and the planet has just been so stable for all those millions of years that until now we have a slight variation in temperature, and now all the bees are dying because of it. Like that makes any sense at all. Such a weak, volatile little honeybee, yet survived millions of years on fluctuating Earth's temperatures and climate change, including multiple bottlenecks and cataclysms, and supposedly survived it all. But yet, here we have the bee today, and now we're getting a little temperature spike, and they're dying, and they're dying off rampantly. Here's a bee in the fossil record dated at 80 million years. Here it is in the New York Times magazine. Look at it, complete stasis, hasn't evolved at all. What is your rescuing device from this? Supposedly, there's been multiple bottlenecks since that time, but yet the bee survived that? I don't think so. You show me proof that anything was ever created, or that anything even could be created like your religion says. Uh, okay. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? The theory of evolution would state that the egg came first too. You see, since DNA can only be modified before birth, this would mean a mutation must have taken place at conception. So some kind of animal similar to a chicken would have laid an egg and a mutated version of that animal would have hatched, which would have been a chicken. This new chicken would then go on and breed and spread its mutation and more chickens would appear as generations go on. So a lot of the evidence would point that the egg would have come first, but these are all just theories. The true answer to this question lies in protein. British researchers discovered something very interesting when looking at eggshells. They noticed that the protein necessary to create eggshells are only found in the ovaries of a chicken. This means the chicken must have come first. The protein is called ovocleridin 17 and it controls the eggshell's crystallization process. Without this protein, the shell just couldn't form at all. Next, we have creation of the universe, which obviously there was a beginning, contrary to the many other theories where they tell you that the universe has always existed. <laughs> okay. We have 
a way to determine whether or not our model, we can do this. We can go, what are the odds that all human beings are related by 99.9%? What are the odds, are the that, odds? All, uh, that human okay, beings have I, to no, no, We're not going to do this because I understand how that... So to actually help them understand some of our models, some of our predictions, some of our thoughts on why we actually believe that the Bible to be true over other religions, I was going to play what are the odds game. I could not get out one answer without being cut off. So now I will finish that for you. What are the odds that all humans are 99.9% .9 all related? Just like the Bible says. And all from the Fertile Crescent, exactly like the Bible says. We have been genetically deteriorating since the fall of Adam because sin brought death into the world and rapid disease increase is evident just like the Bible describes and we can show with empirical evidence that there is both a fast mtDNA clock and a huge increase in diseases every single year what are the odds that we're all frugivores just like Genesis 1 says that God placed man into a garden and gave him every fruit bearing tree to eat from what are the odds that all obligate carnivores can love off of plants, just like the Bible says? What are the odds that the best genetics are tracked to the Middle East, just like the Bible says where man came from? What are the odds that all languages rose around the same time, just like the Bible describes? How about when the scientists found which came first, the chicken or the egg? Today, we know it's the chicken, just like the Bible says. Again, what are the odds that most religious texts worldwide tell us that man has lived to extreme ages during what is known as the Golden Age? And now we know that language cannot arise on its own, because just like the Bible tells us, God taught Adam. So let alone all these facts, quantum physics has indirectly proven God by proving that the argument against the philosophy called materialism has been now falsified. It's dead. Again, so what are the odds that all humans came from a single female? I don't think people consider this fact very much. Let's just take a look at that last comment that I made about all humans being from a single female. What are the odds of this? If a secular evolutionist even considered this for just a moment, rather than shrugging it off with excuses like there must have been a bottleneck, or there were probably many other women alive and those women didn't have kids, or maybe all of them just had boys, completely non-logical, especially when I describe the scenario for you in a minute. Besides, even according to their own theory, they have no proof of any bottleneck occurring, not in paleontology, the fossil record, or geology in the geological column. So, what evidence do we have for this belief of a bottleneck? They don't have anything for it. That's your answer. A failed hypothesis is all that they have. You see, this is the real problem. According to the evolution theory, about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, there were about 10,000 to 30,000 individuals. That's an estimate. Now, let's just say half were women. That leaves us with 5,000 or 15,000, whatever you want to go with. Let's just say that the average is 10,000. For this debate. So now we have 10,000 different lines of possible mitochondrial DNA to be passed down, yet we only have one today. What are the odds of this? That's highly improbable. But if you start with the biblical account, this lines up perfectly as to what we would expect and what we do see. There should be just one line, and there is just one line, exactly what the empirical evidence shows. Vast correlations line up directly with what the Bible says, and this is undeniable evidence. Well, you know what's interesting? When the Human Genome Project mapped the human genome, they said there's only one race of people. You know what that confirms? The Bible. Because we all go back to Adam and Eve, we're all one race. Uh, so I don't think it confirms the Bible. It just makes the Bible consistent with nature on this one point. I'm just going to end the game here, because you get the gist of it. But the list is actually very long, and the odds of even a few of these are astronomically high. So imagine 20 of them. It becomes a statistical improbability. I have yet to see any other animal, especially primate even, ever speak language. Basic communication skills like nouns, sure, but no linguist would ever say that a fish or an ape have a language. As I am looking at my window now, people are driving by in cars. I am yet to see any monkey behind the wheel 
Have you? Mmm, strange. What about food? We make food. We process food. I'm yet to see any animal making food. How about you? How about music? Any animals creating any instruments to play? Not that I've ever seen. What a surprise. But that's just the obvious observation from looking around. Even biologically, we are not the same at all either. And this is what I was trying to tell Aaron last night. However, he was not listening. Ask yourself, why do they still present evidence as though it's somehow logical that we have lost everything that was good for us, like the different kinds of muscle strength that primates have? They are twice as strong as we are, easily. The video that you're watching right now is going to prove that. They are completely immune to infection. They have dense, thick fur protecting them from the elements. We lost all of ours, so now we have to do what? Wear clothing and sleep under more fur? That makes no sense. We sunburn. They do not. We get cancer. They do not. They have far better DNA methylation. They have far better vision and can see better colors for picking all kinds of fruits and flowers and fauna and vegetables. The Tamiran monkey alone eats more than 833 different plants from 167 different floral species and never need glasses for failing eyesight. We cannot even walk without shoes because of our fragile feet and risk of infection or parasites. They have a very thick meninges, which is the layer around the brain protecting it. We humans have a very thin layer in comparison. They have far more nerve fibers than we do. They have no such thing as outdoor allergies in any primate species, yet humans have them all the time. They have far better hearing. They have far better bone density. They can fall down and nothing will break in their bodies unless it's from very high. They have two separate bones in their forearm and lower leg, giving them far more mobility than us. Humans have a greater susceptibility than other primates to most infectious disease. AIDS, malaria, and cancer kill millions of humans each year around the world. As where that's most non-human primates appear to be naturally protected against all of these diseases. If we were part of the primate species, we have failed. They have outdoor allergies. They never fail and they have they, far yeah, better they hearing. They have far better yeah, color vision. They do they have, have those things. No, Arn, you're wrong. We use about 2-9% to 9 of our digestive ability in the colon, as where apes use about 30-60%. to 60 No matter how much sun they get, they can never get skin cancer. We humans get skin cancer very easily. That's right, everyone. We've lost every single beneficial physiological characteristics. How am I supposed to envision, even with pure imagination, that all of these beneficial traits just micro-evolved away into oblivion. That's not logical in the least when you break it down. As for the so-called just 1% different between apes and people, that's a perfect example of skewing the data. Get a female ape, have her hair styled, worked on her, put her in some long skinny dress, force her to wear some heels and walk, add some makeup and perfume, and then bring her to the prom. See how many guys are going to ask her to dance. Or try to get that ape girl on a blind date. Tell the prospective guy that you were, you can't say too much about her, but she's only 1% different from the rest of the hot chicks he knows. Watch his reaction when he sees her. Evolution teaches you to drop common sense on the floor as soon as they give you another science fact. I don't have enough faith to believe that every single physiological benefit has micro-evolved out of, into oblivion for no reason at all. So evolution isn't guided, yet it's predictable. But then if all evolution, therefore, everything is predictable, yet falsifiable. They don't even realize they aren't being logical. So again, the evolutionist would first have to deny their own double standard theory of evolution, which states that evolution is a totally unguided process where mutations are random and things just need to survive. And yet at the same time, it also means survival of the fittest, where only the strong survive and the strong genes breed out the weak, totally contradicting each other. It's shocking they don't see it. Look, this whole business about genetics can be easily solved and refuted with logic. The fuss over 1 or even 50% is not the issue. The matter comes down to this. Would you let your daughter or sister have sex with an ape? Now, come on, be honest. You were probably grossed out by that, even a little, right? There lies your answer. There's something a whole order magnitude different between a human and an ape. We're not the same and not even remotely similar. Stop being crazy and stop listening to the so-called experts who want you to drop common sense and I want you to be logical. Case closed. Is there any proof that God designed man to be this way? Oh yes, 
anatomical observation and comparative anatomy studies prove this as well. Omnivores, for example, can consume both meat and vegetables raw very easily, where both are harmful and hard to digest for humans in their natural form. Both require some form of processing or cooking. All omnivores have sharp fangs and bladed, shaped, crushing molars. Omnivores swallow their food after a short, simple crushing. Omnivores have low jaws, which are always embedded inside of the top. Omnivores have no lateral or fore jaw mobility. Omnivores' saliva is acidic, with no pitolin. Omnivores renal secretion of uricase. Omnivores secrete acid urine. Omnivores all have strong hydrochloric acid in their stomachs. Omnivores require no fiber for peristalsis. Omnivores' facial muscles are very minimal and allow a wide mouth for a gap for food. Omnivores are able to maximize and metabolize large amounts of vitamin A and cholesterol without a problem. Humans have major problems with both. Omnivores are fueled by fat and protein. Humans are carbohydrate-based. Omnivores' intestines are always three times the length of their body. Omnivores all have short colons with smooth and alkaline by nature. Omnivores' jaws are angled and not expanded. Complete digestion is within six to ten hours. Omnivores' examples are hogs, brown bears, raccoons, primates. Omnivores are everything eaters who thrive on all raw foods from leaves and trees and stems to ground roots natural surroundings, ants, and even each other if needs be. A frugivore, on the other hand, has complete digestion in about 12 to 18 hours with a long intestinal sacculated colon. They can only metabolize small amounts of vitamin A and require no cholesterol whatsoever. They require fiber for peristalsis. They all have alkaline urine with weak hydrochloric acid. Fruitarians do not secrete uricose. Fruitarians have alkaline saliva and pitolin. Fruitarians have big salivatory glands. Fruitarians' upper jaws sit on the bottom and have great lateral and forward mobility. Fruitarians chew their food, not just crush it. Fruitarians have flattened big molars, big flattened incisors, blunt canines. Fruitarians see in full color and are fueled by glycogen and vitamin C is required. Fruitarian jaw angle is expanded with extensive chewing required and highly developed facial muscles to facilitate this chewing. Fruitarians consist of several types of species, like bats, the owl monkeys, humans, a number of flying foxes, and many passerine birds, toucans, and some species of parrots. Now consider this as well. Human cells have receptors for malic acid, citric acid, ascorbic acid, ascorbyl palmitate, and polyphenols. These are all elements found only in fruits and their requirements, yet nothing in the human body requires anything from an animal source. Think about it. If it was a baby, they would need meat to survive, yet this is not the case. That is actually disastrous for a child, as where we absolutely require vitamin C and absolutely require fiber and weak organic acids from fruit. Meat is a class 1 carcinogen worldwide. Meat cures no known disease of any kind, only causes it. Only plants can cure people. If you think about it, by all means, name a medicinal chicken or a cow. I'll wait. Another way to tell if a species is fruitarian is to map the area of absorptive mucosa in the gut versus functional body size. Even in 1971, a study done by B.J. Myers was published in the South African Medical Journal describing how lipid profiles and glucose tolerance improved on a particular fruitarian diet. In a further trial in the study, body weight and overweight subjects were showed a tendency to level off at the theoretical ideal weight. Humans are frugivores by design, but when we look at the ability to eat other food groups, like an omnivore through the process of cooking skills, then it's possible. Without cooking, we are not able to survive as a raw omnivore. If you think you can, by all means, please go outside, pull some leaves off trees, catch an animal wild, raw, and eat them up, pull some grass out of the ground that you're walking on, and feast. See some wild lake grooms growing? No problem. Pull those suckers off and eat them. You'll be dead in no time. You are not an omnivore. You are a frugivore just like God designed us to be. I have been one since 2002. And no, I do not supplement. Evolutionists actually believe in the same thing we Christians do in this regard, even if they don't know it or not, that early man was a frugivore. Because think about it, either man was placed in a garden created for the fruit of the trees like the Bible says, or man evolved. Well, if man evolved, what did he do before he invented fire? That's right, he ate it raw. Raw fruit. 
It's obvious, because you can't run around eating raw meat. It's proven to be extremely dangerous, and meat is a class 1 carcinogen no matter where in the world you live. Besides, look at the scientific studies what happens when something eats meat. Let's check that out. Yes, vegetarian IQ in adults and kids are both higher. Since the smartest people on earth have also been vegetarians, then it makes sense. Einstein, Tesla, Isaac Newton, Pythagoras, Plato, Da Vinci, Voltaire. So observation shows that plants are better for IQ. Even the most recent study on vegans show that average to 10 points higher in both male and female. Now, how about genetically? It's often said that we humans share 50% of our DNA with bananas, 80% with dogs, and 99% with chimpanzees. Taken literally, those numbers make it sound like we could pluck one cell from a chimp and one from a human, pull out the tangled bundles of DNA known as chromosomes, unroll each one like a scroll, and read off two nearly identical strings of letters. But in reality, the human and chimp scrolls don't sync up so easily. Other large mutations revised huge sections of text, duplicating a chunk of human DNA here, erasing a chunk of chimp DNA there, while throughout the scrolls, tiny mutations swapped one letter for another. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single letter differences were easy to tally, but the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes, or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places, or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So, yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps, if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. And there's another problem. Just as a small tweak in a sentence can alter its meaning entirely, or not at all, a few mutations in DNA sometimes produce big changes in a creature's looks or behavior, whereas other times, lots of mutations make very little difference. So just counting up the number of genetic changes doesn't really tell us that much about how similar or different two creatures are. Even as far back as 2005, a peer-reviewed study found that we match primates as low as 86%. Evolutionists have said that if we do not match great apes more than other mammals, then the case for common ancestry is debunked and falsified. Guess what? When testing the protein coding regions of other species, we have found that dogs, cats, pigs, and other species have more relation than primates do. So not only have we falsified evolution through fast-ticking mitochondrial clocks, debunking junk DNA, there's no such thing as beneficial mutations, human language formation cannot arise on its own, but now genetic relation. It has been falsified. Evolution is through. Nephi says he wants to have a debate with me, but what he really wants to do is just in a, get in a video hangout where he can, I don't know, yell over me or something. Yell over you? What? That is basically what you did to me on every single comment or question. Look. He even argues that our, our knowledge oh. of molecular processes wait, wait, is not I good enough to ever determine or rule out independent origins. So I it's telling us that, that hello, things of hello. density of hair that they have to protecting them from all elements. They don't wait, get sunburned. Wait, wait, wait. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Let me know Excuse what you think. Me. Now lost their bees, and now except they now have to not. donate by hand. Except that they, they are not. Ability. Well, this thing can't do that thing, then no, that's no, unfalsifiable no, no, and not science. No, Matt, 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 oh, well, Matt. hold on. Uh, something is a mammal, but if you want to buy they, play they by have the exactly taxonomic the same rules, same that is very, very though. strong. They have twice as much density. Yeah, they do I have mean, very, very strong muscles. Information we're talking about, it would have to be no, some no, no. kind of a game. Then we have to get into Pretty recently. Okay, never mind. These questions. And humans are just no, it's not. They never have outdoor allergies. They never fail, and they have they, far yeah, better they hearing. They have far better yeah, they color do. vision. They do they have, have those everything, things. Things all the time. This is genetic breakdown. This is degradation. Genomic Can you explain? We're not, we're not powerful jaw. Look at their immunity. They're immune to yeah, all Yeah, they're all identical. Other species as well. But when these genes mutate, but because that, that, they have that the same 
evolution was true, they wouldn't have function because they well, evolved. No, they are human no, beings so I, far I, long ago. They, they, but you can get no, no they, evolution they know, at a certain stage. It, it, That's all. We our, believe in our, macro our, evolution. It, it just it, finishes it, it, when book. you know well, things. No, 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 no. Hang on. They, they, they're 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 just saying even when they know aren't wrong. Even they what? say they don't know, and there's too much noise at the end of these branches. Zero percent of what? Clear definition of what a species is. Now you can't blather. Okay, so stop. His videos constantly say. I know, Kent Hovind lies again. The longer they spend their time what, in the what, ocean, the less they need to shell. Turtle. Well, the turtle. It's still a turtle. Yeah, we, the how Odonte many species of turtle? Do you have any idea how many species? Not there. And to find results. Whoa, 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 whoa. Something like that. I, I think they're understanding I, a macroevolution is a new morphological straw feature. Man. It's a straw man distortion of by 99.9%. What are the what odds, are the that, odds? Adults, uh, that human okay, beings have to no, We're not going to do this. He even argues that our, our knowledge oh. of molecular processes wait, 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 is not I good enough to ever to determine or question. rule out independent origins. So I it's telling us that, that or, or, hello? things apply. Hello? How about each other? Will they interrupt each other when they talk? Let's see. And they are in the, what he would say, colloquial, the, the groupage. And they could be monophyletic or para. Oh, wow. Look at that. Respectful. Amazing. Watch some more, shall we? All right, Aaron. Um, well, what, once again, you... no, no, I just, it, I always have a good time. It's really, it, it, the explanation is boring. Shannon would be really good to do it with something with that along, along those lines. Maybe. Um, ten, ten if you're old like me. be awesome. Uh, and then, of course, and guys, after sure. that, weekend after that, I'll be back. And so will you admit? Matt, listen very carefully. That would be pre-Cambrian. Okay, uh, and I have. I'm gonna send this to. I'm gonna send this and to those David. Are, um, those are so that we can see this on the screen. And um, monkey drunk. Uh, I, I feel like this. Is gonna, I feel like this is gonna replace the Sphinx guy. That thing. Um, can, 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 Go ahead. I'm uh, sorry. Can you uh, can you can you answer that about the bat? Um, Apply to the same clay. Yes. The colloquial so, word so, ape conforms so, to so when we're, the taxonomic superfamily Hominoidea, which means ape. And we're hominoidia. <laughs> Back in SpongeBob La La Land. This time we're going to talk about what Mr. Nelson has been saying that apes and humans are related. Now, you know your ancestors better than me. I've never been to a family reunion of yours. However, my ancestors were not apes. None of them swung by their tails. Some might have swung by their necks, but none swung by their tails, okay? So in his closing arguments, he said that uh, apes are related to humans. Now, Mr. Nelson, I told you it may take me a while because you are low priority, but I'll be back. And I'll keep coming back till we get it nailed. You said, point number 10, and this may take a little while, the different cladistic categories or taxonomic classifications of life that prove that humans are apes and that birds are dinosaurs are determined objectively according to a suite of morphological, embryological, and molecular data without anyone having to draw lines on paper. We covered some of that last night. We're going to take just the part I skipped. Probably shouldn't have skipped it, but the chart showing that humans are apes. No, we're not apes, Mr. Nelson. I'm sorry. We're not. Even him. Huh? Even him. Even you are not. <laughs> yeah. You sure? Okay. Uh, I had to think about that twice. You can pontificate all you want, stand on your soapbox and say, humans are apes, and that's what you do, I'm sure. And you probably really believe it. I don't question that. Most dictators and um, um, maniacs are um, good at forcefully, dogmatically, and even threateningly saying things until their disciples are afraid to question them. And that's what you're doing about this humans and apes. You talked about cladistics. Uh, it's not just a bunch of lines on paper. Yes, it is. They say, well, we've got evidence for those lines. You could draw lines all sorts of different ways and claim evidence, like I covered last night. But you're bamboozling people, and I want to talk about that here real quick. You are hoodwinking, bamboozling people. You said humans are apes. I'm sorry. No, that's not true. Uh, right here. The charts evolutionists make are claiming relationships. They're pure imagination and are simply lines on paper. Humans are not apes. The hands are very different between humans and apes. Chimps versus humans. Are we different? 
Uh, duh, <laughs> but he can't see we're different. Well, let's look at some of the differences. How about the strength? We had a pet chimpanzee when I was growing up. No, a squirrel monkey. Henry the, the spider monkey. Henry the spider monkey, my brother had it as a pet. That thing was incredible. And the strength was phenomenal. If you held something close to the cage that it wanted, it would reach out and grab it and pull. You couldn't get it away, and the thing was only this tall. According to Hunt, if you shave a chimp and take a photo of its body from the neck to the waist, at first glance, you wouldn't really notice it isn't human. The two species, muscular is extremely similar, musculature is ex extremely similar, but somehow, pound for pound, chimps are between two and three times stronger than humans. Hmm. They are incredibly strong, pound for pound. Let's see. Why are chimpanzees stronger than humans? Chimps are far stronger than we are, but why? And there's plenty on the internet about this topic. They don't look any different. The muscles don't look a lot bigger. The muscles are attached differently in some, quite a few cases, especially those for walking, et cetera, and uh, holding their posture up straight up and down. But they are just incredibly strong. So, Mr. Nelson, the muscle position and strength shows clearly we are not apes. You could work out every day, all day long, and not be as strong as an ape, the same size and same body weight. Conversation. You know, monkeys don't have conversation like we do. They cannot infer the mental state of another individual, whether they are happy or sad. This one atheist said, I believe that a theory of mind was the big breakthrough by our ancestors. One of the ape ancestors just decided to start thinking and wondering, what are other people thinking? Monkeys don't do that. Their brain is different. Why can't apes speak? Unlike humans, apes lack anatomical prerequisites for verbal language production. Fancy way of saying they don't have the hardware to speak. The organs within the vocal tract, such as larynx, muscles, and vocal cords, cannot be moved as freely and coordinated as in humans, especially not at a comparable speed. So they can't talk like we do. Will chimpanzees ever be able to speak? For decades, monkeys and apes' vocal anatomy has been blamed for their inability to produce human speech sounds. But a new study suggests McKay monkeys, and by extension other primates, could indeed talk if they only possessed the brain. So not only do they not have the vocal wiring to do it, they don't have the brain to do it, the part of the brain that's missing, that, talk, that allows them to speak and recognize and understand verbal communication. So, Mr. Nelson, I'm sorry, humans are not apes. They have nothing similar to speech like we do. How about their stance, the way they stand? Humans are bipedal. Apes, and except for short bouts of uprightness, great apes walk on all fours. It's a profound disparity. Kevin Hunt, director of Human Origins and Primate Evolution Lab at Indiana University, thinks humans' ancestors stood upright in order to reach vegetation in low-hanging tree branches. Oh, so they learned to go from four, walking on four to walking on two so they could reach stuff on the tree branches. That's the story they've got. I'm sorry, that's a made-up story. That's not science. How about the houses monkeys make? That's an orangutan's house. Here's a human's house. Here's a chimpanzee house. Here is Alabama's largest house. Mr. Nelson, humans are not apes. No ape or any other animal builds houses anything similar to the way humans do. Nothing close, okay? What about using tools? Oh, he look at that, he picked up a stick. Whoa, okay. I don't think Apes' tools are anything similar to human tools, okay? We have a shop down. How many tools do we have in the shop? Thousands. Thousands. Bunch, okay? No animal comes close to humans in tool use. They might get a stick and shove it down a hole and try to get a few ants to stick to it. If you think that's similar to launching a space shuttle or building a skyscraper, you are absolutely insane. <laughs> Completely bonkers, okay? Humans are not apes. No ape or any other animal uses tools anything similar to the way humans do. So stop saying humans are apes. No, we're not. Human feet are very different from chimpanzee feet. They did not evolve from a common ancestor. They have a common designer. The feet are very different. The bone structure, the joints, very different. The way that we walk and roll our foot compared to the way an ape does it, none of their feet are similar to ours. If you say, well, look, they've got five digits, you know, four toes, and we've got four, to four toes and a, and a great toe. Well, this, again, could prove common designer, not common ancestor, just in case you don't know, okay? This is the human foot over here. This is the ape's foot, okay? The feet are very different on the two. We have a large heel. They have a small heel. 
We have an ankle adapted for walking. Their ankle is adapted for climbing, the way the bones attach there. Stiff midfoot for propulsion when you push off of your stride. They have a flexible midfoot. Uh, anyway, there's lots of differences in the ape foot and the human foot. I think the fact that there are a few similarities is evidence of a common designer. Same guy designed them and did a wonderful job, by the way. Apes feet and human feet are very different. You can study the feet very carefully and say, wow, you could imagine that one could evolve to the other, but that's pure imagination. They know the problem with feet when it comes to evolution. So when they found Lucy in 1973, Hadar Valley, Ethiopia, Donald Johansson found Lucy, became very famous for it. The only thing he ever did in his life of any recognition, I think. But he put, they put human feet on the Lucy display at the St. Louis Zoo. And here's a general biology textbook. How did humans evolve? Hominid evolution. A reconstruction of Lucy on display at the St. Louis Zoo. A female skeleton found more than 20 years ago. Fossilized footprints from the ash. So they're equating Lucy to making these fossilized footprints, which were 100% normal human footprints. Whoa, this is deceit all the way through. Lucy, what nice feet you have. Many of the people, science of biology, different uh, authors said, oh, Lucy had human feet. This is absolutely baloney. Not, was, not a single foot bone was found. None. They have to put it in there, though, because this is a major problem to go from a human foot to an ape foot. I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson. Humans are not apes. Their feet show us that very clearly, okay? The human pelvis is very different from chimpanzee pelvis. They did not evolve from a common ancestor. They have a common designer. Our pelvis is designed for walking upright. Theirs is designed for walking on all four. Our pelvis supports the organs inside, holds, it, it holds them in place because of vertical uh, up and down gravity pulling on them. The pelvis is very different. You could study this for a long time. And I'd like to know how on earth you think it changed from one to the other, from the human to the chimpanzee or chimpanzee to the human, either way, the pelvis is very different. The way the muscles attach is very different. Just the pelvis shows very clearly, and their backbone, walking upright versus horizontal, shows we are not apes. I'm sorry. You, now, you said it dogmatically, and like, Hovind's an idiot. Everybody knows this. You know, humans are apes. No, we're not apes. We're not. Stop saying stuff like that. Humans have a large cranium for the brain. Chimpanzees have a small cranium and a small brain. We have a flat forehead and face. They have a protruding brow and sloping face. We have a protruding nose. They have a broad, flat nose. The differences are immense just on the face of the two. The vertebral column and pelvis is very different because we walk with our head held straight above our body and they walk with their backbone horizontal. The placement of the foramen magnum is very different. Ours is up here where the spine, spinal cord goes through into the brain. Theirs is way back here. How did this evolve slowly over millions of years? How did the foramen uh, magnum change position? And where's the evidence for this? Ours is designed to hold the head straight up and down so your vision, field of vision, is perpendicular to your backbone. They walk with their backbone like this so their head's up and they want to see their field of vision is parallel with their backbone. I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson. Humans are not apes. The foramen magnum, magnum position shows us this very clearly. But they put them in the textbooks like we're related. They drew lines on paper. There we go. That's proof. They got a line on paper. Lord, we're even related to sponges. Whoa. <laughs> Take a bath with your great, 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 grandpa. Yeah, the sponge. Okay. You can believe that if you want, but that's not science. The question whether or not we are close genetic cousins of the great apes has bothered people for a long time. The answers to this question are perhaps even more interesting and reveal some of the inner workings behind the scenes that surround this contentious issue. So let me go back to the 1970s first. Even though we didn't have the, the full human DNA sequence until 2001, and then the chimpanzee sequence in 2005, there was enough indirect data available in the, in the scientific literature back in the 70s to, to make some initial guesses. And from these initial technologies, which we don't even need to get into it, just it's an indirect way of, of getting at how similar we are. There was already this conclusion that there's a good chunk of our DNA that is very close to chimpanzee. Fast forward now to 2001, the human DNA sequence is published. And in the background to all of this 
is the advance of technology. So one of the earliest ways to sequence DNA, and this is important to understand to know why the scientific community has said different things at different times. If you go from the from the indirect scientific methods in the 1970s to the direct scientific methods, one of the early techniques for sequencing DNA directly was called Sanger sequencing. You'd have to have some sort of starting point. There's three billion letters in our DNA sequence. You'd have to have some point for which you already know the sequence. And you could sort of walk along and, and discover the next, let's say, 300, 700 letters. And you'd know what those letters are. And then you, you design it, you use it as your next starting point. And then you do the next 700 letters. And you can see just how slow and gradual this process of discovering a sequence is if it's three billion letters long. So for modern DNA sequencing advance, the scientific community has switched to a different technology. The human DNA sequence in 2001 utilized part of what I just mentioned, uh, this, this slow walking method. But uh, another technology that's been used is called shotgun sequencing uh, and, and as well next generation sequencing. So essentially what this is, you take a DNA sequence, you, you take a sample of DNA, you somehow bust it up into millions of tiny pieces. And ideally this might be, let's say 50 letters 100 letters, 150 letters long, and you, then you can multitask, essentially. You can, you can sequence all of these tiny little fragments in parallel, which dramatically speeds up the process, and then you electronically stitch back together the final sequence. So the, the, the early technology, the Sanger sequencing, where you sort of walk along 700 letters at a time, gives you a very clear, unambiguous answer at the end, but it's very slow. The newer technology, the next generation, the, the shotgun type technology, gives you an answer much more quickly, but it has this inherent ambiguity. Because if there are regions of our DNA that are very similar to one another, it may be hard to electronically separate an error in the sequencing process from a real difference. And it's hard to place exactly where in our sequence it should go if, if you're doing this basically blindly. Well, here's where the, the history comes even more to play. So the human DNA sequence is established, 2001. Chimpanzee comes along and they use a type of shotgun sequencing, not the slow walking method, to get the chimpanzee. And then the question arises, let's say you've, you've taken the chimpanzee DNA, you've busted it up into millions, billions of tiny little pieces that are each 50 to 150 letters long, let's say. How do you stitch the sequence back together? How do you know what it's supposed to look like? Well, the investigators assumed, the evolutionists assumed, humans and chimpanzees had a common ancestor and therefore they could just use the already established human sequence to stitch chimpanzee back together. So baked into the cake from the start is the idea that we're very similar and so you can just align them carefully. Now, what's ironic in all of this, and this is, this is what really gave rise to the, to the common claim that we're 99% genetically identical with chimpanzee. Those two studies, 2001 and 2005, and the 2005 one where they're using human DNA to orient and stitch back together the pieces of the chimpanzee DNA. So what people knew in 2005 is here's, here's a bunch of fragments of chimpanzee DNA, and if we use the human DNA as a template, we can put the puzzle back together in this manner, and it looks like it's 99%. Now, of course, there's a little bit of circular reasoning built into that because you've essentially assumed the human and chimpanzee is very similar from the start. You've used the human as a template, sort of if you're putting a puzzle together. You're using our, the human DNA sequence as the cover for the box for the puzzle pieces, and you're using that to align on the, the chimpanzee puzzle pieces and figure out how it goes back together. Despite all of those built-in, somewhat circular assumptions in the methodology, despite all that, there were still chunks of chimpanzee DNA that could not find any match to human. That was typically excluded from the discussion. So that's another step to consider here. Not only was, first of all, the, the, the chimpanzee sequence built and stitched together on a human template, and the results of that is what they said was 99% identical, there were still, and this wasn't mentioned as much, fragments of chimpanzee DNA that could not match to human, and vice versa, there are parts of human that did not match chimpanzee. Analyzing those data, and one of my colleagues had done this extensively, analyzing these data, it looked like we were more around the order of 88% identical with chimpanzee. Now, that may not sound like a, a massive difference, 99% down to 87%, well, isn't it still really similar? In terms of raw numbers, it's a huge difference. So if we're 88% identical to chimpanzee at the DNA level, 12% different, that means we're 300 to 400 million DNA letters different from the chimpanzee. It's a, it's a pretty big gap. Now, all of this has been thrown into more confusion by the latest advance in technology. They've basically gone back to the old way, in a sense, of uh, sort of walking along the DNA, but they've got 
new tools now. The scientific community has new tools to sequence longer stretches. So instead of having a particular starting point, then discovering the next 700 letters of the sequence and then picking that word ends as a new starting point and on you go, they can now do tens of thousands of letters in one sitting. Then you got a new starting point. Then you do the next tens of thousands of letters, new starting point, and on you go. You, it's a better way to stitch the genomes, but the, the DNA back together. And that's now been done for chimpanzee, for human, I think for gorilla and orangutan, this newer technology that, that should allow you more of a, a bias-free stitching of the human and chimpanzee puzzles back together. However, from my reading of that particular paper that just came out in the last year or two, it seems that the authors punted and didn't even try to answer the question of whether of just how similar, how identical, how different human and chimpanzee DNA is. So to summarize all this up, We've got several histories operating in parallel. We've got the, the history of DNA sequence discovery technology, which has advanced over time. That's in the background. The human DNA, and then there's the history of the, the actual human and chimpanzee DNA sequences. Human dis discovered first, chimpanzee using the technology that exists at the time is broken up into tons of tiny fragments assembled back together on the human template, but there's still this nagging element of the study that shows there's parts of chimpanzee that are just very different from human. And now there's this latest technology, and, and people aren't talking as much about just how similar humans to chimpanzees are. So what is the answer at the end of the day? I have a feeling what we'll discover is humans and chimpanzees will still have a very high percentage of their DNA in common. And this shouldn't surprise or intimidate anyone. Long before we had DNA uh, sequencing technology, long before we even had the field of genetics, it was obvious from the anatomical and physiological levels that humans and the great apes, chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, had a lot in common in terms of appearance, basic body structure, that sort of thing. There's still some major differences. For example, you can look at the great apes, the shape of their feet. They had feet that looked like hands used for grasping tree limbs and such, swing, swinging through the trees, whereas humans have feet that are shaped and built for upright walking. So without even knowing what the DNA sequence is, and if you were just looking at our anatomy and physiology and said, well, what's the, what, what, what would you guess the DNA similarity to be between us and the great apes? You might predict from the outset there to be a high level of similarity because DNA is what encodes during the developmental process the anatomy and physiology that's built. We're similar anatomically and physiologically, therefore we should be similar genetically. It shouldn't surprise anyone. And that does not mean common ancestry. So here's, here's where the rubber really meets the road when we think about what does it mean Really, really, the bigger question we're trying to answer is why are humans and great apes similar? It doesn't matter if you look at the anatomy, the physiology, the genetics, they all basically agree that we're pretty close. Exactly how close is, is still up in the air, but we're still fairly close. What should that imply about where we came from? And this is a question that has been confused by the evolutionary community for over a century. Somehow, I think evolutionists and maybe even lay public has approached this question thinking, okay, if we're made in the image of God, shouldn't we be obviously distinct from the rest of biology? And I'd say in one, in one sense, yes, and in one sense, no. In the sense of uh, no, I don't think the Bible implies that there's a certain pattern that's animal life, and humans should be equally distant from every single animal species out there. There should be no hierarchy. We're, we're more similar to this species than another species. That, that's not implied by the text. And in fact, I think the text implies the opposite. The Bible doesn't say the patterns in which God created creatures in the beginning, but it does tell us we're made in his image. And so if we look at how humans have made things, created things, designed things, this might give us some inspiration into the patterns in which God may have created things in the beginning. So we naturally design things in groups within groups patterns. So if you were to look at the types of vehicles humans have designed even this year, you will quickly see they naturally form a groups within groups patterns. Uh, an automobile uh, has a tremendous amount of similarity to other automobiles. I'm thinking of the American terms now, but uh, an 18-wheeler or a, a semi-tractor trailer is obviously different from a car, but the, the car and semi-tractor trailer are similar enough to each other that it sets them apart from an airplane. And, there's this groups within groups pattern that emerges when you look at all the vehicles that humans have designed, and that's just a sort of a serendipitous empirical observation. We just naturally do this. So why wouldn't God do the same thing? Why wouldn't God design kinds of creatures in the beginning that are very different from us and some that are more similar to us? It helps us realize that we're distinct from nature. There's some things that are very different. There's some things that look more similar to us, but they're still not human. One of the things I wanted to do early on when I started professionally in the in the creation and evolution debate uh, and started with the Institute for Creation Research, now with Answers in Genesis, 
was to write a book called Chimps Don't Build Jets. People get preoccupied with the biology of humans and chimpanzees, and they, they miss the bigger picture. The humans build space shuttles. They go to the moon. They write symphonies. They make all sorts of fancy meals, and chimpanzees don't do any of those things. Mankind has done all these things, and not a single chimpanzee has ever accomplished that, nor, nor will they ever do that on their own, because they're fundamentally distinct from us. So the fact that there's this groups-within-groups groups pattern in nature, where we are closer to some species than to others, anatomy-wise, physiologically, genetically, that is actually a hallmark of design, because humans design things in groups within groups patterns, why shouldn't God do the same thing? And so the fact that there exists this level of similarity that chimpanzees and humans share, that let's say humans and cows do not, that shouldn't bother anyone. This is, this is what you'd expect life to look like if God created the world. What do you think about the, uh, the assumed chromosome 2 fusion? Is this evidence that man is related to apes? But again, that has been disproven decades ago. That is so old, I'm surprised that anybody would even mention it. But the fact of the matter is that we are not genetically related to apes at all. Now, think about it for just a second. Let's run some numbers. Evolutionists would like you to think that as things got uh, bigger, better, faster, smarter, we were adding DNA, uh, accumulating it to get to the bigger, better, faster, smarter, correct? The more complex, more intelligent. Is that right? And yet, there are creatures that have far more genetic information. Apes have 11.5% more DNA than we do, but they certainly are not better than us. And the, the, the idea that is so commonly thrown around, oh, we are, I heard it. I heard it on TV yesterday. This, this newsman who didn't have a clue what he was talking about said, well, you know, we're only 1% or 2% uh, DNA different from apes. First of all, it was never true. Never true. It's a lie. Flat out lie. It was invented about 1998, 1999 with no evidence to support it whatsoever. However, what happened? As we started to understand the human genetic genome, we started to find out that it has vastly different characteristics to that of apes. So, Around the year 2000, uh, instead of being 96, 97, 98, 99% the same as, say, chimpanzees, even the evolutionists, without any evidence beyond the fact that they could start telling that there were differences, only published it was 95.2. But what happened was, as they went on to 2005 and on to 2013, and I want to bring you up to date, the more we knew about the genetics of the human, and we knew the entire genome alphabet in 2003, but we didn't know the ape genome, every character, in 2003. So they were comparing incomplete information with complete information. And they were using the human DNA as a template to put the ape DNA in the order they wanted it to make it look like it came from us, but of course that's not true. The DNA actually is on different chromosomes and so forth. And, and the concept uh, apes have an extra set of chromosomes we don't have and that somehow or another they melded together in the X chromosome. Um, well, what happens? The more we know, the, the more the numbers changed. So if you take a look at the publications, for instance, of the National Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, you find out that the numbers were going down as a percentage. And today, today, we can say the DNA of humans and apes is only 70% the same. Now, let's compare that for just a moment. That's 900 million DNA differences to start with. And even at rates which evolutionists believe material changes beneficially, there wouldn't be enough time to produce a human. And that's using their assumptions. But let's take a look. You don't start at zero when you compare living organisms when it comes to DNA. All living organisms, I don't care whether you're a bacteria, a plant, an animal, or a human being, all organisms that are biological share 25% the same DNA. So you don't start at zero to compare to begin with. I love the fact that you mentioned SpongeBob a little earlier because I just wanted to break out laughing. Uh, and I'll explain why. 
Let's take a look and compare now the genomes that we do know compared to humans and apes. And I mentioned we now know that we're only 70% the same genetically uh, in the genes with apes, right? But, but you're 50 to 60% the same as a banana. You're 35% the same as a daffodil or narcissus. It's the same plant. But you are 86% uh, the same as a rat. At least a rat's a mammal. Is that correct? Uh, but you are 70% the same as a sea sponge. So maybe SpongeBob and we are related. They tell us that man grunted language into existence. But who are they? Scientists. That's right not linguists who actually study and specialize in language for a living. So are you going to take some paleontologist, zoologist, or anthropologist theory for human language development from people who know nothing about it nor study it? That's not logical. So before I get into why it's impossible developmentally, neurologically, mathematically, and statistically that language cannot arise on its own, ask yourself, why would man even wait hundreds of thousands of years before using the same skills of today to record history? Speech is a fundamental part of evolution. Even Darwin himself said speech is 95% plus of what lifts man above animals. So no one can say that language has nothing to do with evolution. It most certainly does. And linguistics requires intelligence. Where did that come from? Language as a code only comes from intelligence. What I have noticed from studying stochastic models is that human language could not have arose on its own, and the numbers required for it to have don't come even close to telling the real story. I'm not talking about communication. I am specifically talking about human language. Keep this in mind. Epoch 1 has nothing whatsoever to do with geology, paleontology, or time. It is a period used to denote the transition from a non-language, Epoch 0, to language, Epoch 1. An epoch is a period that represents a state. Epoch 0 has no grammar, and therefore no language. Epoch 1 is the first use of grammar, and accordingly the use of first language. The period between Epoch 0 and 1 is not a day, a week, or a year. It is any period of time. It is the gradations which require for the transition between the states. That is why it's called an epoch and not a year. After reviewing all possible stochastic models associated with the age of complexity restraints of human language acquisition, it is clear that there were not enough people and that human mental development could never have allowed humans to invent language. These models are what helped me determine this information to be a fact that no evolutionary theory nor debate can get around. I will get into more detail, but for now I think the first important lesson is on the Markov process. It's far more important to help you understand how this process can be used to show transitions between states from no language to language, which are epochs. Now draw two circles side by side. In the left bubble, put the letter A. In the right bubble, put the letter B. Your bubbles represent states, state A and B. If we further define these states, we can say that state A represents an epoch of no language and state B represents an epoch of language. We begin with our entire population of the world in bubble A. They can only move to bubble B if they can pass the burdens associated with the age of complexity constraints which are based on more than 250 years of medical, psychiatric, and linguistic observations. At epoch zero, there aren't enough people in bubble A to overcome the burdens that move people to bubble B, and this number is not even remotely close. There are a lot of definitions in math associated with the full explanation which I will elaborate a little bit on. But, I do not want this to be boring or get lost on you. So, in a nutshell, it is a population problem where language cannot arise on its own. There weren't enough people at Epoch Zero to overcome the burden of the constraints. And the people don't get to graduate to Bubble B for free. They would have to overcome and pass the constraints. If there weren't enough people to overcome the burden at Epoch Zero, then language is not a byproduct of nature. If language is not a byproduct of nature, then language came from somewhere else. If language came from somewhere else, then evolution is false. And because it only takes one piece of evidence to falsify the theory of evolution, I have done just that with this irrefutable evidence. 
I guess the next best way for me to describe this model is by looking at the multiple cases of feral children who are totally neglected, isolated children as well. Specifically, I want to look at Jeannie Wiles' case because I find this one the most interesting. Using Dr. Eric Lindbergh's and, and Professor Suzanne Cutress's work regarding the age of complexity restraints of language acquisition and then applying the data to a small world population, hint, all world populations were considered small until agriculture began, then it forms an infinite no language loop from parent to child to parent to child over and over and over again. There are no natural exits for this loop. Studies have found once a human is in the loop, they are trapped. There aren't enough people to overcome the statistical burdens. It's not even remotely close, even in a large-scale population. If it wasn't even in the ballpark, then I would give it a consideration. But it isn't, and that means there is no natural path to language acquisition. One would need a population size that is sufficient to meet the burdens that are imposed on the population. Language came from somewhere else, and it seems nature had nothing to do with it. You see, you were raised normally, which means that you were provided with language stimuli and you met the standards for language fluency before you turned five years old. The defining difference between language acquisition L1 and the second language acquisition L2 is that the age of the person learning the language. For example, linguist Eric Lindbergh used second language to mean a language consciously acquired or used by its speaker after puberty. Language is only learned for L2. L1 is not learned, it is acquired. And there is a huge difference between learning a language and acquiring a language. Genie was a prime example of that difference. We are not talking about communication again, we're talking about language. You can use your L1 for the rest of your life to learn new abstract concepts or for graduations to learn new language, L2. That is not the challenge. Before there was language, there was no language. The challenge was not to get primitive man to use L1, or new abstract words. Primitive man was like Jeannie, no language at all. She had no L1, nor did primitive man. Dr. Eric's challenge would have been to create grammar, because none existed. You can't compare primitive man challenges to your ability to use your L1 to learn new abstract things. I have noticed that from all the research, that abstract words cannot be learned after puberty because abstract concepts cannot be understood or learned. That information I have gathered comes from the work of Dr. Lindbergh and his book Biological Foundations of Language and more than 250 years of medical observations into all these studies have proven what I'm talking to you about. Let's say today you wanted to prove that human language can evolve and that it can form from nothing. What you would have to do is take every human being in the world and put them together. Now take everybody over the age of 13 and remove them. Now you're left with the people that are, have the ability to learn human language because anybody after that age cannot grasp and learn the abstract concepts to learn language. So wolves do not have a language. They have primitive communication skills. Fish do not have language. They also have primitive communication skills. No professional linguist would say that wolves or fish have a language. To classify as a language, grammar must be present. Wolves and dolphins, for example, have no grammar. Even my friend's bird, who can pronounce words, again, has no language. Only humans have grammar. So we know fish, birds, primates and wolves can't talk about yesterday or tomorrow or the past activities or future activities. They can only make sounds about current activities or base nouns. Only human children possess the ability to learn grammar for L1. Adults can then take their knowledge of L1 and use translations to learn L2. But no language-deprived adult can ever learn grammar without L1. If a person has been deprived of language from the age of 13 years of life, then it's over. Another study has found that anatomically speaking, macaques are perfectly well equipped for human-like speech, even compared with a human. When stimulated, monkey voices sound flat and gravelly, but the words are clear and comprehensible. Then why can't they speak? Because their brains are not the same as ours. We were created different and in the image of God, and God taught Adam. And all of the observational research that exists just helps prove this point. This is a fact. 
Since observations and study began in 1644, not a single case of a child over the age of 13 has ever been able to learn language. And that is not based on some creationism or religious belief. This is all based off medical observation over the past 250 plus years, based on all accepted criteria for falsifying evolution theory by professional scientists this problem beats that criteria because for evolution to be true there had to be a natural path to everything that all species possess knowing all of this imagine now the idea that propagates today that all humans unconnected worldwide all managed to form language independently and roughly all at the same time without knowledge from one another as is obvious now that theory is obsolete The only way Aaron Ra here, and any other evolutionist for that matter, can still say that humans are apes, is to ignore 99.5% of the current data field. For example, the fact that they say humans and chimpanzees have genetic identity that's approximately 98 to 99% similarity, the fact of the matter is, is that the actual identity is only about 88% similar. And you might think to yourself, well, that's still slightly similar. But the thing is, that is over 400 million DNA differences that actually exist between the two species. Because when they figure out that number, that is based on preferential and selective treatment of data. That's why when you don't just use cherry pick data, for example, sequences that they expect to be similar based on their bias, their evolutionary bias, that's how you come to the 88% similarity, which destroys ape to man evolution. And to not go too deep into it, what they don't include is non-aligned DNA gaps, copy number variations, and size differences the reality is the fact that humans are not apes and they were created separately and uniquely in the image of god just as the bible records the y chromosome for example the y chromosome disproves ape to man human evolution because the significantly different dna sequence of the y chromosomes is remarkable and extensive. This is a serious problem for common ancestry because given the low level of recombination and DNA sequence diversity on this Y chromosome, the human evolution paradigm is faced with a fatal blow and serious problem because the human and chimp Y chromosomes should be a lot more similar to each other if human evolution was actually true. They should be the most similar chromosomes in the genome because they are so stable. For example, small amount of variation. But the fact is the Y chromosome is remarkably different between the humans and the chimps. It's approximately 70%. This is a fatal blow. We can look at orphan genes. Orphan genes are fully functional gene sequences that code for both a functional messenger RNA and a protein. And they lack similar counterparts in other organisms. Now, orphan genes that are specific to humans are very convincing evidence against the idea that we evolved from apes. R. and Ross says that we're still apes, but as you can see, genetics proves biblical creation and disproves ape to man evolution now these orphan genes the reason why these orphan genes are very powerful evidence against this idea that r and Ra puts forth is because these genes appear fully formed and uniquely integrated into the complexity of the human genomic network and clearly functional and important to various cellular processes there is absolutely no evidence this is just icing on the cake given everything that has already been talked about. But there's no evidence for common ancestry with apes or any other creatures. 
this amazing category of genes, these orphan genes, are taxonomically restricted genes that are unique to each type of organisms. And these genes appear suddenly without any trace of ancestry in apes or any other animal. And R and Ra can look to a hypothetical SpongeBob La La Land imagination fairy tale, but they don't fit that hypothetical fairy tale. These orphan genes are evidently part of the genomic landscape and is indicative of each created kind. It fits the biblical model of created kinds. This type of category of genes, they're needed for the uniqueness associated with each created kind, as we can read in the book of Genesis. They will also say, given R and Ra's list of evidence here, showing that, quote unquote, humans are apes, is that humans are genetically closer to apes. He'll look to nested hierarchies because a human is genetically closer to a chimpanzee than a human is to, say, a dog or a whale or a banana plant. That nested hierarchical classification system that we see in life. And they'll say that that irrefutably demonstrates common ancestry. But the fact is these relative hierarchies are characteristics of design. If you look at molecular evidence as Aaron Ra points to here. He'll say, human chromosome 2 arose through a fusion of two ape-like ancestors, but the alleged site where the fusion supposedly, theoretically, has taken place actually represents a highly organized functional gene, and there is a significant lack of evidence for a cryptic centromere site. Therefore, that purported fusion site, it's actually a functional DNA element in a human gene. Once again, genetics proves that man is created separately from apes and any other animal. They'll also say, we've all heard it. Aaron Ross says, humans and chimpanzees share genetic mistakes. How do you explain this? Pseudogenes, for example. But pseudogenes are now known based on further scientific discovery, to be functional DNA elements and not mistakes. The junk DNA era, the junk DNA paradigm has been completely overturned. We have only just begun to discover just how amazingly functional the human genome is and it's mind boggling, it's flabbergasting how many experiments would be required to actually conclude with any level of confidence that a particular set of DNA sequences has as absolutely no function. For example, when they look to molecular phylogenetics, molecular data to prove their ape to man ancestry, they'll say gene order along chromosomes has no function. And they conclude that shared gene order demonstrates common ancestry, but the gene order along chromosomes has very important functional roles. Like I said, all this evidence points to biblical creation. Preliminary biochemical evidence for function doesn't just exist for the known functional pseudogenes, but also for at least 80% of all the pseudogenes in humans. And given this known data, it's obvious and evident to anybody with common sense who's not anti-science that the other 20% may still yet to be found to be functional in some human tissue or even under some physiological condition that has not yet been studied thoroughly. For example, many non-coding RNA genes, such as these pseudogenes, are only expressed under certain conditions. Shared endogenous retroviruses, ERVs that Aaron Ra will point to, it's one failure after another. These ERVs play important functional roles as well. They're important DNA elements, not mistakes. They don't prove universal common ancestry. Those pseudogenes, those so-called fossil sequences, they're not pseudo after all. As I've stated many times in debates and discussions with some of the top evolutionary proponents and defenders, these genes are necessary and required to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. Aaron Ra's so-called ape to man ancestry, the fairy tale that he wants to hope, dream, and imagine is true is dead. They've looked at beta globin pseudogene, the supposed broken remnants of an ancient chicken gene, they're now known to be functional DNA elements, all contrary to what evolutionists would have you believe. The Gulo pseudogene, for example, the evolutionists use a very small amount of highly selective data. 
it's all preferential and selective treatment of data and it only represents a very minute piece of the entire gulo gene regions and patterns of the gulo gene atrophy in the various types of animals in which they occur taxonomically restricted in their genomic signatures and lack evidence of common ancestry the data is actually significantly consistent with the notion that they are independent events. It's based on cherry-picked data. And if it occurred millions of years ago, this Gulo pseudogene, the exons would be much more degraded. The Gulo pseudogene that R and Ra would look to is obvious and very strong evidence for genetic discontinuity between humans and apes, not the inheritance of shared mistakes. This is all consistent with genetic entropy and and systematic discontinuity, not ape to man evolution that he'll have you believe. At the end of the day, we are devolving and not evolving. Mutations are not construction, they're not the creator. We are accumulating mutations per generation. Humans, for example, 100 new mutations per person per generation, and these near neutral, low impact, deleterious mutations, they're unselectable. They build up in the genome, we are degrading. These so-called human ape ancestors that they can look to, it's all evidence of a biblical creation model. For example, the hobbits that they look to, the early human population, what we now know is that they were inbred and apparently suffered from a special type of genetic degeneration called reductive evolution, which results in reduced body size, reduced brain volume, and various pathologies. These bones found in the dirt that, that they'll look to, it's more consistent with a biblical creation model of post-flood, post-babel isolation, inbred effects, for example. Even the early human population referred to as the Neanderthal, there's a paper that describes them as highly inbred, had a very high genetic load. This severe genetic degeneration, probably post-babel and, and due to inbreeding and isolation, contributed to the disappearance of this human population. Homo erectus, for example, seems to have suffered from reductive evolution. They were inbred. The genetic degeneration of erectus was less advanced, of course, which indicates the more moderate reductions in body size, brain size, and, and other pathologies. But many paleoanthropologists would fold both hobbit and nelidi, for example, into the more diverse erectus category. This is all we see. Genetic degeneration, the fact that we're going down since the fall, there's no evidence for ape to man ancestry. It's about time these evolutionists quit denying the science. See for yourself how many fallacies and appeals that R and Raw uses in just a four minute clip with another atheist. So you want to withhold judgment wherever possible. What's your opinion of atheists that 100% believe that there is no God? Me. Like are absolutely convinced that that's not the case. That, 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 is that you? Uh, yeah. Oh, wonderful! Can I can I talk to you about that? <laughs> Absolutely. So yes. you you think that there's it, you think that certifiably 100 percent that there is no God whatsoever. That's correct. Right. Uh, not just the Christian God, but any God. Period. Right. Um, how did you determine that? It's understand? impossible by definition. Oh, what's the definition? I would. In order for for some, remember I said that we have different rules. You know that where uh, we won't say that something is proven like a believer's will. You know, if they say, if they find anything that that would still be true in either case, they'll say it's absolute proof of their position. Mm -hmm. But we can't do that because that's dishonest. We actually have to have evidence that indicates that and wouldn't be true if the other case were correct. So we have something objective to verify, right? So we can't say that something is possible until we have a precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating that such a possibility exists. We can't even say it's possible until then. And so we don't have a possibility true, of God. True, we can't say that it's possible, but eventually we could determine that if it was possible or not possible. Like, if it, if we don't it, have the method available to us right now to determine if a supernatural God exists because we have no supernatural scientific methods. But in the event that we do and we're able to ascertain that, in fact, no God exists in the supernatural realm, then we would have a better argument to say that there's no God, wouldn't you? What do you think? Well, there's a handful of words that you kind of need to clarify. Okay. Uh, knowledge and truth and when we're talking about possible. There are things that are possible that we don't yet know are possible, mm -hmm. right? But we can't say they're possible uh -huh. until we, because it would be dishonest. We can't be justified in saying that they're possible. The truth is what the facts are. They can tell you that they have the absolute truth, but if they can't show you the truth of it, mm -hmm. then they don't have the truth. Is that justify saying that there's no possibility? 
Like you're saying it's impossible for a God to exist right now? It's impossible by definition. Uh, I've, I've only given you the first part of If we change the definition, would it then be possible? If we change possible to mean impossible, yeah, if, you, if we reverse everything. If we define so, what we meant by a God, by like, oh, it's actually Greg, he goes across the street, he has lightning powers, he's from Asgard, who knew, right? <laughs> <laughs> what it, People do that, they did the God is love thing, mm -hmm. right? And so they want to come out that, they, that God is the force that creates us all. Well, that's, again, you've made it so ambiguous that everything is God and thus nothing is God. So if you're going to be talking about what is a God, then you've got to conclude that your definition has to include all of the gods, the, the hundreds of gods that were worshipped by thousands of people for thousands of years, or millions of people for thousands of years. So if it doesn't apply to, to, to Odin or, you know, or to, to, to Hera, then it, it, that definition doesn't work. So for me, I've concluded that a god is a magical, anthropomorphic immortal. Okay. okay. Magical meaning miraculous, mm -hmm. which again is impossible by definition. If miracle and miracle and magic have the same definition. They're the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural events in ways which are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics, which so. makes them physically impossible by definition. Okay. Likewise, magical. it is impossible for God to exist in as a disembodied mind absent the brain that created it, because a mind by definition is the data that is produced by a brain. Mm. So it's definitively impossible. So the truth is what the facts are, and there are things that are true that we don't know are true, but we can't call it the truth until we can show that it is true. How would you falsify that observation? What, what? Your position on there's no God based on this definition, how is that falsifiable? How is, how is the falsification you falsifiable? You said it's impossible because of these three, the three, the magical anthropomorphic and disembodied mind and stuff like that? I guess. If you want to, if you want want to, to falsify the definition, uh, no, I want to. I want you to. I want to see if. Is there anything that you would recognize where you'd be like, oh, okay, well then this body minds can't exist, or like, oh, okay, well then magic. Well, you'd have to exist. change the definition of, of what a mind is. Mm. So it, we just have to switch all the words around. So the truth is whatever you want to believe, and and fact is whatever you want to believe. And you know, like I said, the truth is what the facts are, you, and it has to be objectively verifiable. The believers will call about facts all the time. But if it's not objectively verifiable, and you can't, you can't call it a fact. Likewise, they say they have evidence. What is their evidence? Their evidence, I have this book. I get you. I get you. Why do they keep asking me if I will consider the other evidence? I was raised a secular evolutionist atheist myself. What the hell? Of course I know the other side of the argument. I became a creationist recently because of the evidence. Regards to his new information, beneficial mutations, the thing is a lot of them now, even if I gave him a couple, for example, it's still not going to counterbalance the damage, but a lot of it now is based on epigenetic markers and, and they're used and, and acted to control and regulate the activity of our genes, right? So our epigenome can influence our physical appearance in much the same way as our genes do but with no change to the underlying genetic code. For example, diet alters our teeth, swimming alters our spleen size, high altitude alters our you know, chromosomes, hard work alters our bones. But the thing is, there's no large scale evolution, no new information is added, just expressed. Another example of new variants is the glycophorin A somatic cell mutation, which has been identified in some Tibetans, which allows them to endure prolonged periods at altitudes over 7,000 feet without succumbing to apoplexia or altitude sickness. Well, basically, epigenetic inheritance is this uh, new unconventional way of looking at genetics. Up until now, mutation was considered the only thing that could be either positive or negative in regards to fitness, because without mutations, evolution can occur. So this is where epigenetic comes from, and it throws it goes against basically the idea that uh, inheritance only happens through genetic mutations or the DNA code passes on to the parent from offspring. This means that a parent's experiences in the form of epigenetic tags can be passed down to future generations. So epigenetics is the study of where factors influence a gene and how and when the gene is expressed regarding like the Sherpas of the high altitude people of the Nepal. Uh, the mainstream thought is that a single one point mutation led to a better adaptation for the high altitudes of the Tibetan people. But modern science has revealed that the epigenetic mechanisms are also behind this adaptation. It's not a beneficial mutation. You can read a peer uh, pre reviewed paper on this, um, on the epigenetic signatures of the high altitude adaptation of the Tibetan population. If you think about it like twins, uh, twins have identical DNA. And uh, think about it like one person turns 50 years old and so does the other one, right? But one will have cancer or heart disease, the other uh, might not. 
One will go bald or be bipolar or start to lose their eyesight where the other doesn't. This is because of epigenetics. It's not inherited genetic mutations like we're told. Um, uh, take, for example, the uh, epigenome, which keeps a long life communication between environment and our genes that, that turn on and off tumor suppressing proteins. This is a reason why one twin will get cancer and the other will not, because epigenetic changes via the individual diet or environment will it'll cause this. So when you hear about beneficial genetic mutations, you are actually hearing about epigenetic regulation, not beneficial mutations. This is why the Sherpa people who have uh, you know, been called beneficial muta mutations that allow them to thrive at this high altitude, yet when they relocate and have children, they pass on none of these beneficial mutations, so-called, for these high altitudes because they have no genetic requirement for living at such altitudes. So again, it was never a beneficial mutation. It was uh, already present in the gene that got switched on. Evidence shown in that it's nurture over nature. So to make matters worse for evolutionary theory, epigenetic modifications themselves are actually often resulted in DNA errors. And this leads to gradual but inevitable DNA degradation as well. So epigenetic adaptation will never result in any kind of evolution because epigenetic mechanisms only regulate pre-existing biological information. Since epigenetics is not mutation-based, and there is no actual proof for beneficial mutations anymore of all these things that we're talking about, like the, like the lactose mutation. They claim that it was a single SNP, a single point mutation resulting in the lactose uh, persistence, but that's wrong. It's epigenetics like all the rest. Um, they, it's actually a methylation level, uh, MCM6 and LCT genes. So as far as the more they look into the epigenetics, the more that they find that it's that relation and it's not a mutation at all. And then there's a family in Connecticut who've been identified as having hyperdense, virtually unbreakable bones. Fail again. This has nothing to do with beneficial mutations. This is just epigenetic regulation. PCR5 Delta 32 mutation. About 10% of whites of European origin now carry it, but the incidence is only 2% in Central Asia, and it is completely absent among East Asians, Africans, and tribal Americans. It appears to have suddenly become relatively common among white Europeans about 700 years ago, evidently as a result of the Black Plague, indicating another example of natural selection allowing one gene dominance in a changing environment. It is harmless or neutral in every respect other than its one clearly beneficial feature. According to ScienceFrontiers.com, if one inherits this gene from both parents, they will be especially resistant, if not immune, to AIDS. There are people that are actually resistant to HIV. Do you know how they're resistant to HIV? They are missing the key protein the HIV virus binds to. And if the virus can't bind, it can't infect. Now, if you're exposed to HIV, that'd be pretty beneficial mutation, right? Sure. But what's it caused by? It's caused by loss of a pre-existing oh. protein. And so what we see, and I can go on and on, what we see is repeatedly what the evolutionist community does is they offer example after example after example of what they claim, here's how evolution works. No, it's not. Because what you're doing is you're taking pre-existing systems and knocking them out or reducing them. You're not explaining how they evolved to begin with. It's the analogy of if you have a house and in your house you have the dining room and a wall and then your recreation room. And your wife being you know, the big socialite that she is, she wants a bigger dining room to entertain her parties. Well, you have a choice. I can keep my rec room or I can knock at that wall and get a bigger dining room. Well, you know, everybody knows happy wife is a happy home. So you knock out the inner wall and they have a bigger dining room. And it's beneficial because she's happy. But don't tell a carpenter that how you built the house was by knocking out a wall. But that's what evolutionists do repeatedly is they give you an illustration of knocking out a wall and this is how the house was built. Yeah. Genetic evidence is so reliable it can get a life or death sentence even without need of other types of evidence to corroborate it. So the unique fingerprints of mutation and molecular phylogeny are not only profound evidence of evolution, they amount to legal proof of it. You want to pontificate. You said, new genetic information is provided by mutations. That's like saying, if we have enough mistakes in this factory that makes cars, it'll all of a sudden start producing airplanes. Now you just breezed through this with your 10 or 12 or 15 reasons, whatever it was, that I'm wrong and you're right. I'm going to go through them one by one as I get time, because I'm sorry, son, you're a low priority for me. But I'm going to answer them because you're affecting other people. You are incorrect, you are mistaken, or you're deliberately lying, okay? You're pontificating. It is not true that new inf genetic information is provided by mutations. You are wrong. I am right. It is not provided. There is none. 
an example of you pontificating without evidence or authority. So, if you could demonstrate that new genetic information is provided by mutations, you should be honest enough to admit to your disciples that, number one, there's only a few, maybe five or ten, that have been even claimed of the trillions you would need. It would take quintillions of beneficial ones to change an amoeba to a whale or a hummingbird. Quintillions, sextillions, octillion, novillion, decillion. 99% of mutations are harmful, fatal, or neutral. You should admit this to your followers, okay? If not, I'll admit it for you. Folks, this is what he's not wanting to tell you. Wake up, okay? He's leading you down the wrong path. So, let's see. Science Daily listed zero. Biology Wise website had five supposed beneficial mutations. Physics.org had one. Study.com had three. Berkeley had two. University of Cambridge had two. Sanger Institute, one. Charles Darwin, none. Where are the beneficial mutations? Even Mr. Nelson, if I said, okay, all of them are true, I'll give you 10 beneficial mutations. Do you know how many changes there would have to be to go from trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, sextillions, and you can find maybe 10? So a change in an organism's DNA can cause changes in all aspects of its life. Mutations are essential, this is from Berserkly, okay? Essential to evolution. They are the raw material of genetic variation. Without mutation, evolution could not occur. Okay, I would agree. And mutations are all harmful, so evolution does not occur. <laughs> Mr. Nelson. Anyone listening to that grifter? You hippo. Petty and immature. Turn the fan off so you can hear. Narcissistic need to feel important. Made in the bathtub. There you go. <laughs> 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 Hey everyone, we are back to debunk our number one atheist warlock, Aaron Wrong, who will say anything, do anything, or study anything to combat the very God of the Bible that he hates so much. If Aaron thought for even a moment that if learning badminton would somehow disprove God, he would be in the Olympics for it. That is the level of hatred we are dealing with with this man. This level 10 warlock starts off the video showing an x-ray of a human and a chimp, exchanging out skull size and jaw size, giving the impression that if just this slight modification of the two things made chimps evolve into humans. I can do the same thing with cats. And dogs. See how enjoyable that was? Here's the most recent x-ray showing man's most recent common ancestor. Oh wait, that's just a pug. Okay, in all seriousness now, first let's look at the placement of the foramen magnum. As you can see, both chimps and Australopithecus africanus have a vertically oriented orbital plane with the foramen magnum at the back of the skull which is inferiorly oriented for bipedal walking. In all primates, the foramen lies always well towards the back of the skull with the spinal cord exiting at a slight angle. And the skull is more vertically oriented as we see in chimps in Australopithecus africanus. Yet, we see the exact opposite in comparison to humans as full-time bipedalism requires that the cranium sets atop the spinal column, as the centered portion of the foramen magnum helps to balance the mass of the head above the vertebrae. If Sahelanthropus sagensis was a hominid which gave rise to humans via astrolampithecines, as stated by multiple evolutionary storytellers, then the foramen magnum plane would have obviously changed over time to be more human-like in its placement in the Australopithecines, right? Of course, but as you can see, this is not the case. You can see it with your own eyes. The evidence shows the exact opposite of the story they're trying to tell you, and the foramen magnum is actually farther away from the center of the skull. So what? Evolution just decided to go the other direction making a 180 and now having to go further forward to where it was before? This nonsense is exactly what you get with Spongebob evolutionism. It violates Occam's razor as well on every level. Now, 
Let's look at this. Again, we see the exact opposite of what is required for evolution to work when we look at the orbitable planes. Do you see the lines showing the angles of each skull? Well, at the top left, it shows you a supposedly early ancestor of man going back 7 million years ago, which gave rise to the one next to the skull to the right, Australopithecus africanus, which as you know, supposedly gave rise to humans, the skull at the far top right. Now, did you notice anything about these orbital planes? They go from a slight tilt in Sahelanthropus sagensis, and then it reverted backwards in Africanus to an even more primate state that is nearly identical to the chimpanzee angle today, proving that not only is Australopithecus not an ancestor to humans, but it never walked upright either, and it also falsified their own story about how one gave rise to the other in progression leading to modern humans. You see, it's not just about the placement of the foramen magnum, it's in conjunction with the orbital tilt as well, because you can have a foramen location even in a different spot or even closer to the middle like a human. But when the skull is tested along with it and found to naturally be tilted, then it's obvious the animal spent its life holding its head in a position that helped it look up while walking on all fours as to not be facing the ground, just as the human angle is tilted a bit down to help us look forward as we walk so that we do not trip and fall. This is beyond obvious, but like most things evolutionists spew out and call education, it lacks showing you the whole picture. Because if it did and include these other aspects, it would falsify itself quickly. Human jaws have a parabolic shape, not seen in any ape, but Arn won't share that information. Both observation and logic dictate that the theory is 100% wrong. These are just more examples of blatant lies to the public to make it seem more true than it actually is. It shows how evolutionary science is a hindrance to actual science, which tries to falsify itself rather than hunt for evidence to prove the theory is true daily. If they were not so busy looking for the few similarities they could find, maybe they would have noticed the vast amount of differences that far outweigh it. My bet goes to the biased thinking that they use. Critics really need to stop getting mad at us for telling them that they were lied to and then stop taking the liar's side when they are exposed. It shows their true indoctrination and cognitive dissonance. Here's another thing. No chimpanzee has a nasal bone. You can take a pair of sunglasses and place it on any chimpanzee or astrolopithecine skull or even supposed missing link ancestor to test if it's human. So keep this in mind. All humans have a nasal bone and chimps nor Australopithecus africanus do not. The second most important physical trait distinguishing modern humans from the other apes that are still around today is the size and shape of our jaws. It didn't matter that we had such little mouths and couldn't bite very hard because we were already relying on technology to hunt and to process our food before we eat it. The survey said... Aaron goes on to say that our jaw is weak and inferior to apes. Fail again, right out the gate. The exact opposite is true, once again. Humans have more bite force than any primate ever tested. Arn, how can you be so wrong so often and so much about everything you talk about? It's incredible. Literally, on your video on mutations, you were wrong on every single one. I've never seen anything like it. Now, let's look at our ancient, ancestral human counterparts, shall we? Wow, look at that. It looks like ancient man was far superior even compared to primate jaw thickness, size, and teeth as well, let alone modern day man. What are the odds that the evidence lines up exactly with our model and not evolution's? So much for that woo-woo theory of his. You would think he would actually research something before he makes a video on it and gets laughed at by all of us here. But oh well, I'm glad he doesn't because we love the material. Even though the teeth were smaller too, there wasn't always room for them. 
we didn't need the third molars anymore, but our genes are still trying to cram the same 32 teeth into a much reduced space. The survey said... He believes that wisdom teeth are vestigial and humans are evolving them away. First of all, they are not vestigial, and it has been proven that they function and work just like all other molars. Matter of fact, dentists even state that they are a valuable asset to the mouth. Opposed to what he's trying to say, wisdom teeth only cause a problem because our diet has caused the majority of people's jaws to shrink. Since diet causes these epigenetic changes, which affect our mouth, jaw, and teeth structure, then it is just more proof that it is not mutations nor evolution occurring, but rather nurture over nature. An epigenetic adaptation never changes a gene, only the way genes are expressed. Long before epigenetics was ever considered, Western Andrew Price was a Canadian dentist who traveled the world studying and investigating the diets and nutrition habits of various cultures around the world to figure out what caused dental issues in some people, but not others. He cataloged every major tribal group on earth and came to the conclusion that all dental issues were a product of diet from an early age. He discovered that to develop proper developmental facial and jaw structure and to avoid overcrowding of teeth and to not have wisdom tooth development issues, one must resort back to a natural diet off the land and avoid modern day processed foods. You can see from the pictures that not only did he include many twins and close family members, like brothers and sisters in the studies, but directly showed what happens from generation to generation when diet changed or stayed the same, and also showed pictures of those well after their native diet was changed by industrialized diets and foods that were introduced. Dennis today still uses his work. He founded the Research Institute National Dentistry Association, which became the research section of the American Dental Association. natural selection would have eventually weeded out wisdom teeth and people with this Pax9 mutation would have eventually replaced us. <laughs> if you examine the inside of your mouth in a mirror to see just how ape-like your teeth actually are. <laughs> Skew that data, Oren. Skew that data. That shape affords just a bit of space above the tongue that other apes don't have. The roof of their mouths are relatively flat with their tongue pressed against it, which is one of the reasons they can't make anywhere near the range of sounds that we can. That and their mouths are also too deep to make the same noise as we do. The survey said... <sighs> I've already talked to Arn about this. He has zero understanding about linguistics and has zero answers other than the Bow Wow theory to account for how human language arose. That theory is so easy to debunk that it can be shot down with simple logic. Here, let me explain it real quick to everybody. The Bow Wow theory says that humans learned language by mimicking the sounds of animals. So a cat should be called meow, a sheep would be called baa, a chicken would be <laughs> however the hell you spell that. <laughs> Notice anything? Nowhere on earth has any culture ever used the Bow Wow theory as part of their language. Nowhere is an animal called by any of those names, as far back as we can look at language. It's a dumb theory, and Arn Ra believes it. Next, he's completely wrong, yet again, no surprise, that the first in-depth study results on the subjects found that anatomically speaking, apes and monkeys are perfectly well-equipped 
to speak like humans, even compared to us. The simulated monkey voice sounded flat and gravelly, but the words were clear and comprehensible without question. They even share the same regions as humans in the brain responsible for speech, called Area 44 and F5. Forcing animals to talk through electrodes is not proof that one day they will learn language or evolve to do it. Lab experiments are a far cry from reality. Think about my friend's bird, for example. It can say many things. Is it ever going to evolve to use that ability? Never. What about the software? Because there are also genetic mutations that are expressed in the brain. For example, expression of the FOX2P gene underpins the skill of producing minute complex sonic fluctuations in songbirds as well as echolocation used in bats and verbal communication among humans. FOX2P doesn't just control the mental comprehension of what words mean, but more accurately, the skill of motor operation, synchronizing the movements of the jaw, lungs, tongue, throat, and mouth for the coordination of all these subtle movements required for fluent vocalization. Well, now that science has proven that this is true, then activating both FOXP2 genes and tweaking only two tiny changes in the sequence of the substitution of the two amino acids should now easily give primates the ability to use their vocals to speak since now that we know anatomically speaking they can. Let's see what an expert who has done just that has to say about it. Wolfgang Ingard, who studies the evolutionary history of FOXP2 gene in Max Planck Institute in Germany, has come to the logical conclusion and assumed that since humans have two working copies of the FOXP2 gene, then that is what must be required for language acquisition for normal spoken language, if evolution is true. So, first, he studied 63 chimpanzees, 11 bonobos, 48 gorillas, 37 orangutans, and 2 gibbons to find which species had the closest match to humans. After obtaining the data, a year later his team altered the orangutans' FOXP2 genes, because they already had one functionally working copy, by substituting the two amino acids which make the human's gene different, and then activating both copies of the new gene but the study was unable to obtain any results regarding speech or new communication skills. Simon Fisher, who was part of the team that discovered the original FOXP2 gene and the first to link it to language, concluded, There is no such thing as a gene for language. <laughs> the study also lends weight to the idea that language didn't evolve from scratch, and he's correct. God taught Adam, and it's the only way language could possibly exist. Proven from over 300 years of observable tests, no one over the age of 13 has ever been able to learn language without acquiring L1 first. This leaves everybody over the age of 13 unable to contribute to the formation of language. Not only that, humans are the only species on the planet to have rosehip neurons. No primate does. But the question is, how can these recently discovered cells that make up over 10% of the neocortex, how could it have evolved is an evolutionist worst nightmare? The fact that it's only humans and has now been proven to be required for regulating the flow of information to certain parts of the brain and also how they interact with pyramidal neurons in the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus and the amygdala is just another example of how humans are nothing like apes whatsoever. They did notice, however, that harmful mutations even in just one copy of the FOXP2 gene had major implications such as severe motor speech disorder or differences in cognitive and generalized motor skills, while a mutation in both copies caused major brain and lung developmental issues. So while no benefit was seen by altering or activating these in primates, harm was seen by deactivating these genes looks like things are the way they are for a reason. FOXP2 was found to be functionally different in humans compared to all apes. Not only that, the gene is protected from change so much that they say it is highly constrained. So they had to come up with a rescuing device saying maybe it was under strong purifying selection. But they have no evidence for that either. So we already knew how to communicate way before we made up words where 
this sound now means that thing. <laughs> We're not the only monkeys to do that either. African vervet monkeys have uniquely distinct alarm calls specific to whether they're warning about the presence of a leopard or a snake or an eagle. Different species of monkeys have their own words for things too, or the concept of words, at least simple nouns, the basis of language evidently already existed maybe 10 million years before we invented verbs too. The survey said... Basic sounds are not language, Arn. Wolves don't have a language. They have basic communication skills. Fish don't have language. Apes don't have language. They have primitive communication skills. Get that? No professional linguist would ever say that wolves or apes possess a language, or that fish do, because non-humans do not communicate by using language. It's simple. To be classified as a formal language, grammar must be present. Wolves and dolphins and apes do not have grammar. Only humans have grammar. So all known fish, birds, primates, wolves cannot talk about yesterday or tomorrow or past activities or future activities. They can only make sounds about current events based on nouns. <coughs> only human children possess the ability to learn grammar for L1. Adults can take their knowledge of L1 and use translations to learn an L2, but no language-deprived adult can ever learn grammar without L1. If a person has been deprived of language for the first 13 years of their life, it's over. Speech is what made Homo sapient. Think about that. I have far more than you. Are we different to the animals? Yes, you can run this test too. Yeah, so we different. Yeah. So it well, no. We're exactly the same in every possible way. Are we different to the animals? Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. We're exactly the same in every possible way. And that proves my point. <laughs> Why does this do this? Oh, we forgot the fan. Oh, I got, I'm sorry, Aaron. I'm sorry. Here, turn the fan on there. Okay. <laughs> Is it working? Do I look more intelligent? Ah. Uh... And I've got a series of videos explaining the evolutionary stages of that, if anybody listening to this cares. That ought to be exciting. He's also a pathological liar. Are you drunk? If that sounds silly to you, imagine how much sillier it sounds to rational people who don't make believe in fairy tales like you do. You guys can imagine anything you want. Go ahead. Go ask your mama to explain it to you, okay? It's not hard. So, for you morons that are trying to distract attention... Uh, of ex uh... It's <laughs> I calls himself Aaron Ra, but I don't like the Egyptian goddess. I know that you call me Larry just out of disrespect, but I don't respect you either. Uh, this question's for uh, Arn. Um, you, uh, you mentioned that in 20 years of rigorous research, you found no evidence, uh, I think you said, of Christianity. But no, no, no. I said in 20 years of arguing with Christians that they told me that, the, that I'm wrong about the belief in faith, that faith is not a belief that is not based on evidence. Right? I say that faith is a belief that is not based on evidence. They all say, oh, yeah, we have evidence. I say, okay, fine. What is it? And I've always specified that I'm looking for scientific evidence. They ask, what evidence would I accept? I said, how much evidence would you, would you accept, they would ask. I said, I'll take anything that qualifies as evidence. Any body of, of objectively verifiable facts which positively indicate or exclusively concord with that particular position over any other. In 20 years, I, I think I get, without I get. exception, okay. there has been no one to present any scientific evidence that actually indicates the Christian God or indeed any God or in fact anything supernatural at all. 
Okay, I appreciate the clarification. So, you mentioned that in 20 years of rigorous research, you found no evidence of what you're looking for, but then when Michael pressed you on naming just one scholar who defines the word faith in the way you put it, you couldn't name one. So my question is, could it be possible that your research is maybe flawed, biased, and even maybe dangerous to the pursuit of truth? I have conducted this experiment, as I explained, over and over and over and over again, having this exact conversation at least once a week for 20 years. <laughs> Not one Christian ever has produced evidence. He didn't either, nor can you. No one can. It doesn't exist. That's not the I debate demand tonight. that anybody, anybody in this room who calls yourself a Christian, if you think you have scientific evidence to indicate you're God, bring it. You ain't got it. I win. The phylogeny challenge is, is fallacious because... It all comes down to, you know, where can we draw the line regarding ancestry? Where can we, uh, where does that phylogeny break down? But the thing is that entire argument misunderstands biology and genetics because, and, and theology, because they seem to imagine that God created humans and then all of other you know biological life and that there's absolutely no similarity between humans and any other species out there so based on the biblical model there's really no reason for us to believe that that's true as in you know there should be no type of hierarchy in in the biological world um as in you know there's no reason to believe that we shouldn't be more similar to say apes than to another species say a whale Right? So we too predict nested hierarchies in biology, whether it's um, on an anatomical level, physiological, morphological nested hierarchies. So that's why I always say we need to look to differentiating kinds of evidence to show which explanation, limited ancestry or universal ancestry is true. And that's where we um, can get into function, we can get into Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA predictions. Uh, this is how we're gonna truly answer the question of, of ancestry. So long story short, the phylogeny challenge is it's fallacious and it's based on a misunderstanding of science and theology. According to our model, uh, I'm just going to throw some, you know, kinds out there. Say humans, pigs, rats, ducks, and dogs. They're all land dwelling, okay? Even though they are separate kinds, according to our model, since they are all land dwelling and share many similarities with each other, they can share similar nested hierarchies or designs. So where are we going to draw the line between those separate kinds if they already share certain levels of nested hierarchies, morphologically speaking, genetically speaking, physiologically you know, speaking? So that's the thing. Even though we predict nested hierarchies, evolutionists, when they say that there's this perfect nested hierarchy, there's this perfect phylogenetic tree of life, that's not actually true because anytime there's an inconsistency, say a lack of uniqueness in that phylogenetic tree, it's usually explained away by what? Convergent evolution. So that's a rescue device. There's also something called independent lineage sorting. If you look at different genes in say humans or apes or gorillas or orangutans, uh, depending on the gene you're looking, can create a totally different type of phylogenetic tree. Once upon a time, pond scum became all life on earth. Stupid.